Smile Solutions, StreetSmileSolutions.com, and today we're going to go over things that you can buy at the Invisalign store, specifically their type it uh, Way back when, when I took my Invisalign courses, plural, because they made me take it more than once, um, long story, but um, we got actually a type it that came with the course. Of course, back then it was a destination course, and you got like a basic type it just to show how you take the aligners on and off to show patients, because that's pretty much all they had back then. <laughs> But um, I guess I just was peeking in the store recently and I saw they have all different types of type of which can be super helpful in explaining different types of treatment to patients, precision cuts, um, attachments, all those different things, bite turbos, MA. So I went and decided to, you know, bite the bullet and purchase a type of Actually, it wasn't bad. It was like $140, $150. Um, I got the class two type of as you can see here. I already had the regular one. I don't think I lost it at some point. But um, this one's actually useful, and I've made a ton of videos about precision cuts, slots versus button cutouts, um, hooks, um, elastics, how to wear them, class two versus class three, etc. And a lot of you are getting a little bit confused on the different topics, so I just said, you know what, I'm just going to buy the type of and I'm going to show you guys on the actual Invisalign type of type, type on how things work, okay? This is what the packaging looks like. I already pulled it out of the sleeve. Um, this is what it looks like when you get it. Um, so, let's see, sorry, obviously I already pulled it out. It comes with one set of elastics, one quarter medium. It's not really my favorite elastics to wear with um, Invisalign, and I'll explain a little bit more. It is one of the elastics, and it depends on the orientation of things, but we're going to go over that on how elastics work and how to pick the right elastic for your case. But let's go over what they gave us to start. Um, I'm going to go ahead and lower this a little bit more so for you guys won't complain if you remember I'm, I'm just an orthodontist I'm not a professional videographer so my videos are going to be a little bit janky um I'm doing the best I can uh, so a lot of you are complaining out there on YouTube world oh your videos are unprofessional well yeah they are because I'm not a videographer right I'm just somebody who's making videos showing you guys how to do things but clearly you guys are getting the idea okay so but i have invested in some technology so hopefully my videos are getting a little bit better all right so mainly we're here to talk about the class two arrangement what to do in class two cases i've got literally dozens of videos you can put in the keyword overjet in my channel i think i have over 3,000 videos now you can put in invisalign you can put in class two you can put in elastics and lots of videos will come up but remember, for class two cases, of course, it, this really isn't a class two case. I'm not really sure why they called this class two. Hey, <laughs> it's class two canine, but it's not class two molar. So that kind of changes the things. Oh, this side is. Okay, there's an asymmetry in this case. Got it. This is why the midlines are off. But anyways, typical class two case. Um, got some crowding, kind of class two, division two. Um, if you don't understand the difference between class two division one and class two division two, class two division one is when the front feet are flared out. Class two division two has this kind of usually tucked in, um, you know, lateral look. That's where they're basically dumped back, right? They're trying to compensate. That's class two division two, just so you know for insurances and for diagnostics, the difference. Um, treatment's gonna be a little bit different depending on what the issue is. So, of course, the first question I always ask whenever I have a class two patient is, is the patient still growing? And that's not a question you can just answer based on age. There's a lot of questions you need to go into. I'm not going to go into how to find this out because I have a ton of videos on it and really you should know. Um, but if you don't, um, research my videos or you welcome anything that I'm talking about that you don't 100% get. You can go to my website, straightsmilesolutions.com, send me a message and I will literally handpick the videos and send them to you. I have no problems doing this for you. Or you can send me an email at info at streetsmilesolutions.com. Those are the fastest ways to get a hold of me. Yes, you can message me on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, but I'm not going to be that fast. And sometimes I miss it. So it's better if you just contact me directly if you want to know something. Um, if you want help on a particular case, it's not something we're going to help you with through Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, email. It's illegal. So uh, if you not he want help on a particular case, you'll need to schedule a session in order to do that, you need to go to our services page. There's a small fee for support on a case. Um, but anyways, so find out if your patient's still growing. If your patient is like many years post-pubertal, there's no way there's any growth, okay? Then things are the way they are. Um, of course, you can take a hand wrist x-ray to verify that. And I have um, really great diagnostics that I wrote on my own about hand wrist x-rays and how to read them. You can ask those puberty questions. 
You can get growth charts from the pediatrician. There's a lot of things that you can do, right? Um, in general, um, girls hit puberty between the ages of 8 and 13, usually averages around 11. Boys hit puberty between the ages of usually 10 and 15, averages around 13, 14. So a little bit later than girls. So if you have a girl, they probably already hit puberty. If they have this many permanent teeth in, I'm pretty sure they're done. But you can ask. Sometimes there's one off, so it's always good to know. If your patient has growth potential, obviously that changes the rules. You want to really consider something. Obviously, you're going to want to do a Ceph, get Ceph metrics, and I have lots of videos on reading Cephs. If not, we can help with you one-on-one -on, -one on reading them. I don't do the diagnostics myself. I'm going to recommend you use a program like CephX. You can send off them. There's a small fee um, to run, get Ceph numbers for your case, but I can help you interpret the Ceph, certainly. So... Um, MA is mandibular advancement. MA is available with Invisalign. You can get it in the US, you can get it in Canada and most other countries. I know in Australia, they're only offering it to orthodontists, but I've had some general dentists who are able to use it. You just have to give them a call and explain that you have experience and they've let plenty of general dentists that I work with use MA. It's just not gonna come up initially on your, um, on your portal as an option. So MA, just to let you know, and on this video is really not gonna be about MA because I have other videos on MA, but I did get an MA set of aligners. So MA is called mandibular advancement. This is what it looks like. So it's basically like a twin block, but in aligners. I'm doing this through the lens, sorry. I have it upside down. Okay, here we go. That probably helps. So if you ever looked up what a twin block is, it's an appliance, it's like a holly with little like wings, woo, um, that helps to position the mandible forward. Um, and little increments, well, not the twin block, but the MA does, so that the mandible, if there's growth potential left, is stimulated to grow. So you can see here, it's just a regular aligner, but in this area, there's some wings that go right here, right? So when the patient closes down, they're gonna hit this and slide forward. So we've got aligners going on for the most part, okay? But we also have these little wings, which is gonna help stimulate the lower jaw to grow. This is only gonna happen if the patient has growth potential remaining. So no sense in putting this in the treatment plan if the patient's not growing. It's a complete waste of your time. You cannot do MA and some of the other things like distalization, class two elastics at the same time. It's either one or the other, which makes sense, right? Pick a, pick a direction you wanna fix the bite and stick with that direction. Now, you can try that first and if you didn't get as much growth as you wanted to, you can do the other stuff afterwards. But I just wanted to show you now that I finally have a copy of what MA looks like actually in my hands, um, what it looks like. So, um, so far I've actually seen a lot of great things with MA. Now keep in mind that it's nothing new, you know, it is in terms of meshing it into aligners, but it's nothing new in the world of orthodontics. We've been doing growth modification um, with mandibular advancement for 60, 70, 80 years. I mean, these things were built in various appliances, activators, twin blocks, bionators. These were things we've always done. Um, I would say it's kind of fallen out of fashion in the US, but in Europe and in other parts of the world, it's been happening for a long time. I personally love them, I think they're great. Um, but I'm excited that now it's part of Invisalign because before what I was doing is I was using those other appliances first and then going into my Invisalign, which is not wrong. You can still do that if you want to. Um, I'm doing that a lot more with white label aligners. I'm using the other appliances first and then going into white label. So that way, you know, I can save money. But MA is not an additional charge. It's now part of comprehensive or you can have it part of Invisalign first. Obviously these, um, aligners have baby teeth in them, a few of them. So this is, I don't know, it could be Invisalign. It could be Invisalign first. It could be comprehensive. You can do comprehensive with baby teeth in. Just remember, you only get five years to do it. So a lot of times if the patient is nine or 10, I'm going to go ahead and do a comprehensive case. I'm not going to do Invisalign first case because I'm going to pay twice, right? And A plus B doesn't equal C. So Invisalign first plus Invisalign second is still a lot more than one Invisalign comprehensive. So if I think I can pull this off, you know, um, I'm going to start with Invisalign comprehensive. If the patient is seven or eight, of course, they're going to have to have Invisalign first because that's not going to happen otherwise. But anyways, that's what MA looks like. So let's go back to our type it on so you can see what's going on. Um, so, you know, regular stuff, you've got your attachments, but mostly we're here to talk about the class two correction. Oh, one thing I want to talk about first was... Um, the compliance indicators. Personally, it isn't. It used to be free on Invisalign Teen, and it was kind of a gimmick way back when, when, um, when a lot of parents weren't comfortable with Invisalign for their teens. But now we know that it works just fine. 
um, adds. It isn't something that I pay the $35 to add on to my cases for. I don't see the point in that. Um, because a lot of times, honestly, if they wear it for two weeks, 10 hours a day, it's still going to turn colors and look like they wore it, which is not as effective as wearing it for seven days, 22 hours a day, right? So for me, it's a waste of money. I can also just tell by looking at the bite, looking at the teeth, looking at the color, looking at the dinginess of the aligners that they wore it. So waste of money for me, but if you like it, go for it. Um, patients don't have to know that, right? Uh, okay, so let's talk about precision cuts now. So here we've got two different types, the two different types of precision cuts. We've got our regular um, slot, which is right here. So you can you see this tear draped slot, tear shaped slot that's in the aligner. See it right there? I think you guys can see it. It's like literally cut in. So if I pull this off, see the tear shaped slot right there? Putting my finger in it, okay? So this is where the elastic hooks on. If you're doing the traditional elastic route for class two, which is slots for the upper canines and buttons for the lower molars. So here's your lower molar. See the clear button right there? It's actually glued on the tooth. See it? So that's a button. You don't make that a composite. That's something that's prefab. You buy it and you glue it on the tooth. I like the Invisalign ones. They actually, a lot of you ask me which ones to buy. I do think they're the best clear ones that I've seen and I've used. I like the shape of them and they stick pretty well. Of course, metal ones work just fine too if your patient doesn't mind. You're going to go ahead to place the buttons. You're going to place your either your, your template in or an aligner and you're just going to place it while the aligner's on. Of course, you want to make sure your aligner's not bouncing fully seated because if it's not fully seated and you put the sucker on, it may never fully seat, right? So make sure it's on well. Put it on, it shouldn't be right up to the edge of the aligner or at the gum line, it should be right in the middle. I like the way they angled this here, that makes sense. It's angled in the direction that the elastic would go. So that's pretty smart. They also make round ones, you can buy them from anywhere, um, metal ones, etc. So basically the way this would go in this situation is that the elastic is gonna hook here with the, with the thing on. And we'll talk about sizes of elastic shortly. So. There's all different sizes of elastics, and I've got a ton of videos on that. Um, but remember, elastics have to be changed every four to six hours, so your patient should be running through quite a lot of elastics in just one day. So you can see how it's on here, and then it's going to hook to the slot on this. So sometimes you're going to want to put this on first, and then put this in. Patients can be a lot more smooth at putting these on than I am on the type on through a lens. <laughs> and then hook it to this. See how I did that? So this is slot and this is cut out, slot to cut out, okay? So what they gave me in the box was one quarter medium. I like to think of it like I do in braces. In braces for a class two elastic, I'm gonna actually use 3 16th heavy. So the reason, if you're not getting a lot of improvement, it's probably because you're using the one quarter medium. Now, if you're using button to slot, you have to use probably one quarter or three sixteenth medium because you can't use heavy elastics on a slot. Because what, think about this, you want the patient to seat this, but yet this is pulling this out. So it really affects the tracking. I see much less, less favorable outcomes when you do it this way than when you ask for a button on the canine. So you don't have to do this slot to button. You can do um, button to button. You can also do slot to slot, but then I think you have more tracking issues. Considering the most tracking issues are in this area, and even on this model, you can see there's tracking issues already. See how it's not seating all the way? It's like a counter force and it's gonna affect how things fit. So ideally you want things to fit like more like this. See how I'm seating it, oops, seating it all the way up. And you saw the difference when I put the elastic on, how it fit, right? Let's do that again. Okay, so it's, it's tried to pull it out. Now it's not tracking again. So that's my concern with the whole slot to button, which is the default. If you ask for class two elastics, this is what you're getting unless you modify it. See how it's happening? So all day long, this thing isn't fully seating because you're pulling on it. Whereas if you put a button up here instead and didn't have it attached on the elastic, you will not have this problem. The cases will track better, they'll work out back better, they'll work out faster, and you can use heavier elastics. So the elastic I recommend if you do button to button, you can't do it like this, would be something like this, which is 
316 heavy. This is a little bit extra heavy. Um, six ounces. Yeah, no, that's fine. 316 heavy. You can get these from eBay. You can get them from any orthodontic company that's out there. These work better for button to button. But slot to button, you're either going to use 316 medium, okay, 316 medium, or one quarter medium. Now, medium can be 3.5 ounces, 4 ounces, or 4.5 ounces, but all of them should work. So how do you know whether you're going to do, ooh, we are moving. How do you know whether you're going to do 316 medium or one quarter medium? Well, you want to get the smallest possible diameter elastic that the patient can comfortably put on. So I believe that this, what is this? Can't remember which elastic this was. Okay, let's, let's start fresh. So let's try on the one quarter medium, which came in the bag, okay? Here's one quarter medium, came in the bag. Okie dokie. So you can see the diameter of the quarter medium is a little bit bigger. Are these non-latex elastics? Really? These look awful. Where are these? It doesn't say. These look like non-latex elastics to me, the clear ones, and these are like terrible elastics. So, see the difference between latex and non-latex? It doesn't say that they are, but, oh no, I wouldn't use these. Okay, well, this is good to know. It doesn't say. But this is the one quarter medium. This is the 3 16th medium. See the diameter is different? They're both medium, but the diameter is different, okay? So it can stretch a little bit more. The problem is if you use too big of a diameter, it's not gonna pull as well and it's not gonna work as well. So you wanna use the smallest possible diameter that the patient can comfortably take on and off. So this is something that I kind of fundamentally degree, disagree with. Oh my God, there's like no pull on this. This isn't gonna do this. So this is, cracks me up that Invisalign would throw these elastics in this kit because this has zero pull to it. I could put it on so easy, it's still slop. You know, it's not even tight. This is not gonna fix this bite. So this is BS. So if Invisalign sees this video, your stock elastics are not going to fix a case like this. I can full on tell you that. So, but I can fix a case like this, especially if I'm adding distalization. Now, remember, if you're going to use distalization to a case, especially like on this side where you're class two, you can't have wisdom teeth impacted in the way. I mean, they could be like high and dry, but they can't be right like here because it's not going to move, right? So, in wisdom teeth, either have to be extracted or they have to be high and dry. So you need to check your pano because it's not going to work. And that's not Invisalign's job to tell you if that's going to work or not. So I'm just letting you know that. But distalization is fantastic. It really, really works well. And you can do amazing things with distalization. But of course, if the patient is still growing, you want to use your MA. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the heavy elastics. So this is my favorite. Now, remember, you can't use the heavy elastics with slot to button. It's just, it's going to pull it out. So I don't even, it might even do it in the demo but you're gonna see that they're a little bit thicker. And remember, I want latex elastics on every patient unless they have an actual documented latex allergy. Like documented, like doctor actually says they are, not the patient just says they are. Because half the time they're, they're not telling you the truth, they don't even know what it is. And because the non-latex elastics don't work as well, in my opinion. Okay, so this is heavy, okay, 316. This is what I want you to use, but only if you have button to button. So this might be like way too much for this type of knot. I haven't even tried it before. And it's really thick, so I don't even know if you can get it on the wing because it's thicker and I can't. <laughs> so that's why you cannot. But yeah, basically it's the same thing. See how I had to struggle a little bit to stretch it? That's how you want it. Like patients should have to struggle. If your patient is breaking their brackets a lot, you need to watch my, or breaking their buttons. You need to watch my video. I go through all the things about breaking buttons, why they're happening. It could be that your diameter is too small. So it depends on like how big the teeth are, how deviated the jaws are. So you might have to use quarter heavy in that case until they get a little bit closer. Or you can use the quarter heavy during the day and the 3 16th heavy at night because you know they're staying closed at night and it should work well. But you have to probably stop quite a few elastics in your office to find the right one for your patient. All right, hopefully this was helpful. Thanks so much. Hey, it's Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com. And today we're gonna to talk about class two and class three elastics. I know this um, infographics is class two, but either way, same thing. Um, well, not the same thing, but th same thing in this context. 
Um, we're going to talk about if you should use buttons or slots and how that works and what things you need to adjust accordingly. And the feedback I'm giving you today is really just based on my own experience, what I've seen work, what I've seen not work. And I never learned it in any Invisalign class. I mean, definitely in talking to my colleagues, you know, you always get little tips and see how other people do things. And then I've kind of extrapolated it um, and had the, I guess, the fortunate experience of being able to take things that I did and extrapolate it to all my doctor clients, you know, so almost um, exponentially, you get to see more outcomes than you'd ever see in your own lifetime with just your own patients, right? So I've found this, and a lot of times I come up with things on Invisalign or about Invisalign, and Invisalign steals the ideas, and then I've never heard them say it, and all of a sudden they say it, and they don't even give me credit for it. So I'm saying it now before someone else says it. Um, I forgot, I'll throw it in a blog too. This is my idea. Maybe other people do it, but. I've never heard anyone else say they do it. But anyways, so the standard kind of turnkey model, if you ask for class two elastics um, within Design, if you ask for that, you're going to get upper slots, which are built into the aligner, and lower buttons, which you're gonna have to glue on the teeth. So the elastics are gonna hook from the lower button that you glue on the teeth with the template to the upper slots, which are punched into the aligner. Nothing special you have to do there. Okay, so that's your standard class two. The flip or the reverse you get for class three. So class three, the standard that you get, unless you ask for something, it's kind of like going to Starbucks. You ask for a PSL, you're going to get the standard PSL. But you can have all kinds of modifications put into your PSL, right? You can have it with this, this foam, this other stuff. And everyone has their preference, right? But if you don't ask for something, you're just going to get the standard, right? Which is a tall with one shot, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Same thing with the liners. So standard, I explained standard class two. Uh, standard class three is the flip. You're going to have buttons on the upper sixes, which are three and 14. And you're going to have slots on the lower threes, which is 22 and 27, right? The it's kind of a hybrid thing. So you you use um, moderate elastics or medium elastics, which are four to four and a half ounces, three sixteenths usually, sometimes one quarter. Um, the problem that I have with that is most of the tracking issues that I see in most patients, um, unless you're really good at making an awesome ClinCheck, are going to be right around in this area, which is usually around where the buttons are, right? So what happens when you have the button hooked to the tray and the patient's compliant is you end up having more tracking issues and more unseats, um, which is why I don't like to have any slots for my patients at all. The only time I would do slots is if my patient had already finished their aligners and we were just working on the bite. Then I'm fine with slots. I don't care. If you, you know, I don't have to bond buttons. But if we're if we're aligning at the same time, it's really important to me that I don't have a counterforce pulling, trying to pull it off, you know, all day long, 24 hours a day, because that's going to affect my aligner seating, right? Can you kind of get what I'm talking about? So for that reason, I prefer all buttons, button, 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 no slots. And then I can use a heavier elastic, which is the 316 heavy, which is six to six and a half ounces, six to six and a half ounces. That's the elastic I would use with braces. So obviously I was trained to do braces before I was trained to do aligners. So in my mind, I'm trying to do things similar and I know that they work, right? I know this mechanics work in braces. So let me extrapolate what I learned from braces to what works for me in aligners. So this is what works. I ask for all buttons, no slots on all my aligners, unless, 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 um, I've already finished all the alignment and we're just wearing a consistent tray with elastics to work on bite. In that case, I don't. And also the other trick that you might do as well, if you really want to be like extra strong, you know, is I will often, I mean, I do this anyways with most of my doctor's treatment plans. I reckon they slow them down. So Invisalign says it's 15, I say it's 30, right? If I really want to do class two elastics with slots and not buttons, like you're having issue with the buttons staying on or those crowns or um, patients complaining about the buttons or something, you know, they're uncomfortable, then I double the trays even more. Invisalign said 15. Normally I go 30 because I think their stuff is too fast anyways. Well, guess what? Now I'm going at least 45, 50 because I need elastics and I can't bond them to the teeth. So I need this to go real slow and gradual and so that they can, you know, right now what's really important to me is just having the movements as slow and as predictable as possible if I'm gonna be pulling the trays off with the elastics all the time, right? I don't wanna go too fast because I know I'm gonna get off track and I gotta just do things like three times as slow. And, or you can tell the patient to stay in 14 days instead of seven. Eh, I don't quite think that does the same thing but you could do a combination of all, of all the above if you get the idea. So basically it still takes the same amount of time ultimately. 
it's just slightly less inconvenient, a little grosser for the patient, I think. But all right, hopefully that was helpful. Thanks. Hi, it's Dr. Amanda with Street Smile Solutions, streetsmilesolutions.com, and we're going to talk a little bit more about um, elastics, specifically class two and class three elastics with Invisalign or aligners and how it's different from braces. And please watch my previous video about the elastics where I talk about um, how to put them on, how to use your elastic placement tool if you need it, where to order it, how to wear class two and class three elastics with braces. But let's talk about how it's different with aligners. So you might get buttons put on your teeth and have the elastics anchored to the buttons and the aligners will go on top. And that's actually my preferred way because I find when you, the other way is where you anchor them to the aligners themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you have to use a lighter elastic to do that because they are actually hooked to the, um, to the aligner. And if you use too heavy an elastic, it can pop it out, right? When you, when you yawn or something like that. But if it is hooked to your um, aligner, you're gonna have a little bitty hook on it. And now I'm looking for the hook to see if I can find it. And this one doesn't have it. Okay. So we call those precision cuts. Do I have one on here? Yeah, kinda. So let me show you what the button cutout looks like first. This is Invisalign, okay. So button cutout's gonna look like this. See how it's like a half moon shape? And then the button gets bonded on your tooth and this just goes over it. It's like a little window, okay? And if you have one of the little hooks to hook it to, oh, hmm. Button cutout, button cutout. Well, okay, I made one here. So we'll use the one that it looks more like a little like wedge is chipped out of the thing, okay? And then you just go ahead and slide the elastic over it, okay, like this, see that? And it'll go to your aligner, but that has to be a lighter elastic because it also can cause fit issues because it's constantly wanting to pull it out. So that's not my preference. I prefer to anchor it to the tooth itself. So same concept as with braces, whether you're gluing it to the teeth or you're hooking it to the aligners, ultimately up to your doctor. My preference is to go ahead and bond it to the teeth. That way I can use heavier elastics and I can do it quicker. But good question for you to talk to your doctor about if you have any questions. All right, thanks so much. Hey, this is Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, streetsmilesolutions.com. And today we're gonna to talk about different orientations of elastics. You can have the same orientations in braces or aligners, although in braces it's a little more prevalent than in aligners. Um, you don't really need a box elastic or a tri you could use triangles in, in aligners, but usually you can use class two and class three are the only ones you're going to do. But in braces, you're going to use all these. These are the primary four elastic patterns that you're going to use, and there might be some modifications. So this is box elastic, and if you watch my previous video where I talk about size and strength of elastics, I'm not gonna repeat myself, so go back and watch that one. I also have other videos that talk specifically about elastics with aligners, so you'll wanna go and look for that too. You can search through keywords within my YouTube site. If you can't find it, feel free to email me at info at streetsmilesolutions.com or go to streetsmilesolutions.com and send me a message, and I'd be glad to send you those videos, no cost. Um, I know where all my videos are, and I'd be glad to send them to you. So this is the box elastic. Um, go back to the previous video to find out when and why you'd use it. But box elastic for me is usually used with um, a bite plate or bite ramps to help to level the curve of speed. It's often optional. You can The curve of speed will level on its own, as providing that you put the brackets correctly and you give it time and you have a nice um, night tight wire. But sometimes patients are in a heavy in a heavy, in a hurry. And they wanna hurry up and get that leveled out so that they can move on to the next heavier wire and start closing space or fixing bites. So that's why the box elastic. I feel like it gives the patient some control to speed up their treatment. It's optional in my world. Um, sometimes box elastics might not go from canine molar, molar canine. Maybe you'll just have it in the pre-roller region. Um, sometimes we use uh, box and triangles to finish cases at the end too, the subtle bites and stuff but I also use them at the beginning in the leveling wire. So you're gonna have a lighter elastic if you're in a lighter wire and a heavier elastic if you're in a heavier wire. Here's the triangle. Sometimes I do triangle like this, but you can see I was kind of lazy in the demo to put the Kobe hook on this. So I was like, I don't feel like putting on a Kobe hook. So we're gonna make this triangle like this, but it's, I use that elastic at the beginning to help to bring down a high canine, especially like I mentioned in the other video, if the patient's in a hurry and they really want that canine to settle and they don't want to wait for the 
wired to do its job, great. We can introduce a triangle elastic. Um, you can also use it um, to help fix open bites if the open bite extends all the way to the canine, but I usually will put an anterior box elastic in the front as well. Again, we're gonna be in the light or medium if we're in round wires and a heavier elastic in terms of strength, maybe more like six ounces if you're in a heavier rectangular wire. Now we've got our class two and class three elastics. Class two elastic is to help to fix over jet where the front teeth are ahead of the bottom teeth and class three elastics is to help to um, fix edge to edge bites or negative over jet, AKA underbites. Um, no, it shouldn't really look like this. I didn't notice that I had it tucked under there till after I made the infographic, but it's really, that's really not a problem. Sometimes it's gonna happen. But um, yeah, you need to, with elastics, you need to teach your patients how to put them on, how to take them off. And of course, they're gonna be changing their elastics every few hours so you need to send them home with plenty of elastics. Fun fact, elastics also do lots of other cool things. Um, I find orthodontic elastics to be very useful around the house. I use them with all kinds of things. And they also make great tiny little hair braid elastics or doll ponytails, just letting you know. So you will love orthodontic elastics. I use them everywhere for everything. So anyways, hopefully this was helpful. Elastics are awesome and give me a holler if you have any questions. Thank you. Hey, this is Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com, and today we're going to be talking about maxillary distalization, which is a great way to correct overjet without having to completely rely on class 2 elastics. Yes, you still need them, but you can get a lot further with than with elastics alone, and you don't have to do all that IPR. Now, I know you're looking at this terrible drawing that I made, and I'm certainly not a graphic artist, as you can see. I would love to show an Invisalign case, but every time I show one, I get nasty letters from their legal department, even if it's my case. So um, they say you have to have permission to show a clean check on a YouTube video. So I guess... Um, I have to be a little more careful, so I decided instead to create my own graphics, which are really ugly. Um, and yes, we have four molars and no premolars, uh, but you get the idea. So after I finish talking, you'll be able to watch the video play um, and you'll be able to see what the, the whole thing is about. But basically the goal is you can definitely do three to four millimeters of molar distillation, but the, you have to have attachments on the teeth, first of all, for predictability. Second of all, max three to four millimeters and that's only if your wisdom teeth are extracted and if there's bone behind it i mean if they're completely no bone and you're already like in the ramus that's not going to work right so you have to look at the pano and you have to look clinically and say can i do this invisalign does not know if you can do this okay they're going to set it up because you told them to do it but that doesn't mean it's possible and they're not going to check to see if your wisdom tooth is there so that's your job to make sure you you're doing it. And if you're taking out the wisdom teeth before delivery, I would give it a few months for the bone to fill in, whereas you're gonna have some very unpredictable movements. So again, three to four millimeters max, wisdom teeth need to be out and healed. Um, attachments on teeth, class two elastics, um, cut out to cut out, not slot to slot, 316 heavy. Um, that's what you need. Um, and it should work, you know, and if it ends up being like a huge 10 millimeter over jet, you can always add some IPR as well. Um, but the elastics are for anchorage. So if they don't wear it, you're not going to get as good of an outcome. So it's really important that you explain the why behind the elastic wear. And I don't think this is going to play. Nope. Okay. So um, I will show the video after this and you can go ahead and take a look at the movements. Again, this is just to show distalization. It's not to show perfect occlusion or anything, but just wanna simulate what you can ask for in an Invisalign setup. And no, you can't do this with clear correct. You can't do this with most aligner systems. There are definitely some that you can, but not all. Um, and again, it's up to you to check clinically to see if this is possible. You need to see if the teeth are extracted. You need to make sure the roots are healthy enough to do this. No pathology, no impactions. All right, there's my tricks and tips for maxillary distalization. You can do the same on the mandible, but I would say max two millimeters, maybe one and a half to two. The bone's a lot more dense, um, it moves a lot slower. But if you've got a slight class three case and no impacted wisdom teeth, why not, you know? 
Why not? All right, thanks so much. Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolution.com. And I'm going to do a follow up on a video I did a few months ago about broken brackets and how to be able to diagnose or look at a broken bracket and know whether it's a compliance based issue or if it's an issue with your own bonding system or perhaps the materials. And it's actually pretty easy to find this out, but you need to do some detective work. Um, so I'm actually going to do a very high level overview right now. I'm not going to repeat everything. And then I'm going to merge onto this video, um, the broken bracket video where I go into each of these points a little bit more because it's the same thing, broken button, broken bracket, same thing, same problems, right? Of course, you got a patient in braces and a patient in aligners with buttons, which are essentially brackets, right? So it's a little bit different. Um, in terms of the experience, but the actual me mechanics behind it is pretty much the same. So we'll be merging a few videos that'll be helpful on the end, but just a friendly reminder um, in terms of the buttons, first things you're gonna wanna find out, first questions I ask is when, when, where, why, how? So um, remember your Invisalign, your braces patients hopefully are getting take home instructions which have a food list. And if you need a copy of that food list, it is something I'll be glad to give you. Normally, uh, my documents are free for our VIP and concierge members. But, um, uh, you know, if you schedule a phone call with me, I'll be glad to send you the food list, even if you're not a, a customer of Straight Smile Solutions. So you can just go to our contact button on our website. But in any case, your Invisalign patients need to also get a food list because they're getting brackets. Yes, they may only have two or four brackets, but they still have brackets. So no, they can't eat that crispy taco and no, they can't eat that pizza crust. So nine times out of 10, it's because you kind of forgot to give them the food instructions. <laughs> so let's start there, right? But remember, just like we're gonna go over in our video shortly about um, the broken brackets, with Invisalign, it really depends when. So when did that button break? If it broke within 24 to 36 hours of when you put it on, it's on you, doc. You can't charge your patient for that. So that means you improperly etched, primed, isolated, it got contaminated, you're using a cheap bracket, you know, one of many different things. Your light cure unit needs to be calibrated. And the way you can look at this is see where the leftover glue is. So I always tell my patients, hey, we're gluing something on your teeth. The way it works is if this breaks within the first 24 to 36 hours, I need you to give me a call the second it breaks, not days later. If you call me within that window, that 24 to 36 hour window, we're not gonna charge you for this bracket and we're not gonna add it onto your broken you know, tally. Even Invisalign brackets, you do the same thing or Invisalign buttons because that tells me it's me. I did something wrong, my team did something wrong, it happens. I've had many, many, many things happen. Let's put it that way, okay? Many, many things happen. I've had contaminated primer. I mean, sometimes I don't exactly know, but when I throw something away and replace it, it magically goes away, right? Um, but all these things that I have listed here could be the problem. So you have to kind of go through all the things. But if it breaks beyond that 36 hour point, you know, patient comes in, when did it break last week? It's been two months since you put it on or three months since you put it on. Guess whose problem it is? It's only one of two different things. Patient diet, okay? Or it could be an interference in the bite. If the patient is biting down, you know, they take the aligners, they have the aligners in, it's all fine and dandy, right? When they take them out to eat, if they're biting on that bracket, you have to check occlusion before they leave the office. If they're biting on that bracket, I usually recommend they eat with the aligners in. I know it's a little bit nasty, but they're gonna break it, right? And that's okay. And the other thing you can do if they don't like that nastiness is you can do a, warrant, a um, modification, you know, like a mid-course correction, just right where you are, you know, just like you would if something wasn't tracking, but you double the amount of aligners. If we had 20 aligners left, well, I'm gonna do 40 or 60 and take smaller steps. So that way my patient can change aligners every three to four days. Well, then they're not so grossed out having to wear the aligners while they eat. 
No, Invisalign doesn't like it when you do that. But guess what? I got no choice because I got to wear the buttons and the patient keeps breaking the buttons. So I'm just going to slow this way down so that they can change aligners more frequently so they can wear the aligners when they eat. And that way they won't break when they eat. Bingo, works really, really well, right? It doesn't cost you anything. Now, of course, if you're using a different system where you're paying per aligner, well, sorry, <laughs> that's not gonna work for you. So that's one of the benefits of the unlimited version. So, all right, so that's pretty much what I got for you right now in terms of buttons. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and merge the other videos on the end of this and we're gonna teach you a lot and hopefully this will solve the problem. One more thing, if they swear up and down, and this will happen, at least half the time. Oh no, I didn't eat anything wrong. We do the food journal. So the food journal is the easiest way to do this. They need to keep two weeks worth of a food journal, everything they ate, everything they drank, you know, and it, it, it needs to be very detailed. Everything that went in their mouth, snacks, everything for two weeks. It's even better if you can give them the journal, like if you can buy a bunch of journals at the dollar store, otherwise they can do it on their phone, but I actually want it, I wanna see it. So, and they need to bring it in to their appointment, their next appointment, and you're gonna sit down and you're literally gonna say, Taco, tell me about how you ate that. What type, of, what type of tortilla was that? You know, pizza, tell me about how you ate that. Did you eat the crust? Show me how you ate the crust, um, et cetera. So sandwich, well, what type of bread was that? Show me how you ate it. No, you can't bite into the French roll, you know? That kind of stuff, because usually when you go step by step at what they ate and what they snacked on, you know, what, flaming hot cheeto? Nope, can't eat that. So you find things that could have loosened it, because sometimes what's gonna happen is the bracket is gonna fall off, say, at two in the morning but what loosened it is what they ate the day before. So you have to kind of extrapolate when they tell you when it broke. It broke at 2 p.m. on March 27th. Okay, so let's see what you ate. Also sugar things, sugar drinks and stuff like that can weaken, can weaken and anything with um, acid, um, anything with bubbles is acidic. So there's a lot of things that can weaken the bond. So sometimes we have to go through what they ate and how they ate in order to find what might be loosening the bond. So I know it's a bit of a pain, and again, I know you might have questions about, well, can't we just do slot to slot? Well, I've got videos on that too and why I'm not a fan of slot to slot. So why the buttons are better. So we can go over that too. And I'll be attaching that on the end of this video. All right, thanks so much. Hey, it's Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com. And today I wanted to talk to you about something that's probably a little overdue. But now that I'm starting to get a lot more doctors who are starting to do straight wire since we launched our digital straight wire course, um, eventually brackets are going to break, right? It's just kind of par for course. It's going to come with anytime you do straight wire or braces, kids, adults, sometimes there's going to be random broken brackets. And the occasional one here and there is not a problem. But if it's chronic, um, it's really going to slow down the treatment and or completely stall the treatment. You're going to be spinning your wheels. So. It's really important that you learn to understand the why behind bracket breakage. Um, is it things you need to improve on your end? Is it the things that the patient needs to improve on their end? If it's chronically a patient problem, then it sounds like your team probably isn't, or you aren't, you know, talking about compliance and what's expected of them and what, what they can do and not do, right? So um, anyways, we could probably talk about all this today for like, a good 30 minutes but i just wanted to talk about a few high level points in terms of understanding the why behind the bracket breakage so the first thing i do um is i generally have a 24-hour window so i let patients know whenever i put brackets on or put a new bracket on that hey if you have any problems with this bracket any breakage in the next 24 hours i need you to give me our office a call immediately i need to know you need to report it within 24 hours because any breakage within 24 hours is probably on your end, something you did wrong. We can go over all those points. And that's that's a problem. If your team or you is having breakage, you gotta identify what the problem is because it's gonna keep happening um, if, you don't, if you don't fix it. So I would wanna know. And any phone call that you get beyond that 24 hour point is now the <laughs> most likely the problem of the patient. It's something the patient's doing wrong. And remember if the patient's doing, a lot of patients are doing things wrong, it's your, policy, your compliance policy, and everything like that that you need to work on because, you know, that still isn't normal. But in any case, so let's go over beyond the 24-hour thing. So let's say whether it's 
pre-24 hours or post-24 hours. The next question I'm gonna ask once I need to know when it happened, I wanna know how it happened. So they may have, you know, some feedback. Oh yeah, sometimes they'll start out say, you know, um, yeah, sorry, I was eating a taco, you know? Okay, problem solved. You know, but if they're like, gee, I don't know, it just happened, then that's where you need to dig into it a little bit more. And then you need to ask to see the bracket. So actually have the patient bring the bracket in when they, well, obviously if they broke a bracket, you want to um, reuse that bracket so you can save money. So you want them to make sure they save it. But you can ask them on the phone, hey, can you turn your bracket over? Do you have it in your hand? Can you tell me a little bit, is the, is the glue on the back of the bracket or is the glue still on the tooth or both? And the answers to that question will pretty much tell you which direction. Now, I would make sure you don't tell the patient this kind of cheat sheet because then they're gonna just say whatever they wanna say, right? Because they're gonna learn. But, um, so let's start with glue on tooth because that's a little bit easier. If all the glue is on the tooth and the patient feels it, it feels lumpy and bumpy on the tooth and they look at the bracket, the bracket that they saved and there's no glue on the bracket, that makes it pretty easy to isolate what happened. So usually in that case, if there's glue on the tooth and not on the bracket, then that means that could be a light cure issue. That's always an issue. Like if you have a light cure, sometimes they start you know, dying out um, and they need calibration or you need to replace it. And you can still see light and if it's not the right power, you know, or you know, whatever intensity, um, then you can have breakage and you wouldn't even know. So that's always an issue. You should always keep an eye on light calibration, especially if you're using one consistent light. Um, or even if you're using more than one. Okay, number two could be you use too heavy of a wire. You know, like it was really displaced and you tried to put in a 16. Yeah, it may not break the second you, try, you tie it in, but it might break later that night or the next day. And if so, that was you. Um, number three, someone could have been like a little heavy handed at tie in, you know, a little too much force, a little too rough. Sometimes it won't ping off that very second, it'll ping off a few hours later. Um, of course, patient diet compliance is usually the main thing usually in this situation it's something they ate um or they got you know trauma they got hit something like that they bumped they fell or it could be a bite interference where the way the brackets go on for ideal um a tooth is hitting a bracket and again these are things you have to check but you have to check excursive or extrusive movements as well so those are all pretty much things that you did wrong or the patient did wrong so either way you know, and, and you can kind of ask leading questions, but if they're super adamant, I have no idea how this happened, you know, just happened, then be thinking the other ones. Okay, so let's go to the one that's a little more difficult, which is where the glue is still on the bracket, not at all on the tooth. Tooth feels flush, nothing on it. In that case, it's still probably something you did. So it could be improperly etching, the duration, the stuff's contaminated, it could be isolation, they're getting, there's blood, there's plaque, there's, um, you know, there's saliva, you're not using like a NOLA or something. Um, what else? Sometimes it's happened to me before that an assistant to prep uses like the little normal profi cups, but those have like oils in them. So that will prevent it. So you don't want to use that. If you need to prep first, I would just use plain pumice and water. Mix it up yourself. They sell some cups like that. Or just use a dry toothbrush. That's totally fine. Um, or anything like that. Also, even toothpaste before bonding can cause that problem. We're using ACK or Listerine or something like that. Also, whitening too close to your bonding appointment. That's another thing. Um, obviously, priming, we talked about that, or the primer gets contaminated. So you have to read the directions on the primer carefully um, because some primers have to be air dried, air thinned, or light cured. So make sure you're using the right one. And, and if your team has worked in other offices or if you change brands, they may not understand that. Of course, light curing improperly, there's 20 second lights, 40 second lights, 10 second lights, three second lights, and the calibration can be off too. So just making sure you're getting it from all different angles and stuff like that. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So, so many things, you know, over time, eventually you'll, you'll learn to be able to figure these things out and, and uh, improve things on your own. All right, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me at straightsmilesolutions.com. It's Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com, and today I'm here to clear up some verbiage. Now, a lot of people use some of these terms synonymously, and it gets doctors really confused, so let's go ahead and clear it up. The words I'm going to be talking about today are in terms of aligners, so we're talking about buttons, attachments, 
um, precision cuts, slots, and cutouts. So let's go over what each of those mean. And some people might use different terms, so I'm gonna talk about how I use them. First of all, precision cuts are the little holes that are punched into your aligners so that you can use elastics. Usually they're class two or class three, and if you don't know what this is, go within my Straight Smile Solutions channel and search. If you don't know how to do that, I have a video on how to do that. So it's just a few videos behind this one, so take a look or email me at info at streetsmilesolutions.com and I will send you all the videos that you're looking for because I know where they all are. But in any case, I'm gonna talk super high level here. So precision cuts are the little punches that are made by Invisalign the company so that you can hook elastics on. There are two different ways to hook elastics. There are slots, which are cut in to the actual aligner itself. These are not my favorite ways to do things, and I have a bunch of videos on that. And I will be attaching those videos, I'm bundling them together, maybe to make a playlist shortly thereafter to explain the why behind it. Um, my preference for precision cuts would be the cutout, okay? Not the slot, which is in cut into the aligner where you hook the elastic on the liner, but the button cutout, which is a half moon shaped hole. You can actually make like with a hole puncher and you put glue a button on the tooth because when you glue the button on the tooth, you can use, first of all, a heavier elastic, which means you get more bang for your buck in a shorter period of time but also you don't have issues with a liner unseat because for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And if you're hooking your elastics on the aligners themselves, you're counteracting the force and the need to seat it and engage it in the undercuts and in the attachments. And you actually tend to have way more tracking issues. Now Invisalign doesn't say this, but this is just my personal opinion after seeing tens of thousands of different cases. I see way more aligner unseats issues with tracking with doctors who use the standard elastic on the actual liner itself, which is your standard type of class two elastics. If you just ask for class two elastics within the Invisalign portal, that's what you're getting. You're going to get um, the slots on the upper canines for class two and the molars with the buttons on the bottom. Opposite for the class three, you're gonna get the slots on the lower canines and the molar buttons on the upper molars, right? But guess what? You can override that. You can do all four buttons. That way you can use heavy elastics. For the most part, your heavy elastics are gonna be 316 heavy, which is six to six and a half ounces. That's what I recommend, which is the same ones that we generally use in braces. Now remember, I have a lot of videos and I'll attach them at the end on an additional playlist. You can't, there's no cookie cutter approach. That's the average. If the patient has an, a bigger, bigger than average teeth, bigger than average mouth, you might have to use one quarter heavy. If they have a smaller than average mouth, you might have to use one eighth heavy. So you need to stock a lot of different elastics. With elastics, you wanna get the smallest possible elastic in the patient's mouth that the patient can comfortably take on, take off and talk, but they should feel pull. If it's just slack and just hang in there, it's not working. It should be a stretch to put it on, but they should be able to be comfortably talk and chit chat without um, the patient struggling, without causing TMJ pain, they should be able to talk normally during the day. Sometimes if they're on the border and I'm like, oh, they're somewhere between the 3 16th and the 1 quarter, I will use the 1 quarter during the day and the 3 16th at night when their mouth is closed and they are sleeping. That way we're getting pulled. So you got to get creative with your elastic wear. There's no cookie cutter approach. So again, we talked about slots. We talked about cutouts. Uh, we talked about precision cuts. What else? An attachment is the composite that goes on the tooth to help as a handle to move the tooth. That has nothing to do with elastics, okay? Uh, what were our other things? Buttons, buttons can be used synonymously, okay? So I've heard of buttons used as elastic and buttons used as actual buttons. So buttons to me are what you buy in a bag and you glue on the teeth to hook the elastic on. That's what I call a button. And in terms of what buttons are best, I, whatever one works for you. I mean, metal buttons always work great for me, but nobody wants metal buttons in class two on upper canines because they're ugly if they're paying for Invisalign, they're not gonna be too happy, right? I personally think that the buttons that Invisalign sells in their store, they're crazy expensive, but they work really, really well for me. So that's pretty much it. That is how that's explained. Hopefully that was helpful. Have a great day. 
Hey, it's Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com, and today I want to encourage you to follow along as we talk about Invisalign attachments. Um, if you want to follow along with this blog article, I just published it. Today is the 6th of September, 2020. You can go to my website at straightsmilesolutions.com and go to the About Us section and go to blog, and this would be the most recent blog um, that's on there. So in this blog, I go through, I believe, seven or eight yeah, eight um, tips about attachments and auxiliaries for Invisalign. And these are just things that you're not going to find in a textbook or anything. Just like if you asked an orthodontist, hey, give me your top eight tips about Invisalign success in terms of attachments. These are my personal tips. They might be different than someone else's tips. This is just what I've experienced. Um, those who are part of my um, consulting group, um, who are doctors that are on, in my network, they've heard these all before so um, they may agree or disagree but anyways I'm gonna take you through eight of them um, again feel free to follow along by going to my blog so um, basically and you can find it by going to the about us section and then going to blog uh, okay so number one um, basically number tip if you can put attachments you can put attachments on both the lingual and palatal of teeth so you don't only attachments don't have to be just on the cheek side or the lip side they can be on the inside as well and if you put two attachments on it really really helps to unravel a rotated tooth especially premolars but you can also do it on canines i don't usually do it on anterior teeth but you could um if it was on like um you know like a like really rotated lateral or something it's just going to be twice as efficient if you've got an attachment on both front and back now of course if you've got it on the back of like some top teeth you're gonna to need to remove that attachment eventually to try to otherwise you're gonna have an interference right it's gonna work almost like a, a bite tab but you know while you're spinning it you can leave it on and all you have to do is ask for it they're not gonna give it to you unless you ask for it um, number two so Invisalign needs more attachments than any other system because of retention so their material is pretty flexible if you've seen my videos where I compare Invisalign to other aligner systems you can it's super elastomeric which is great because that lowers the forces for the teeth it's healthier for the teeth it's more comfortable for the patient but it is bad because you need a lot more attachments and also their trim line is like super scalloped. So they need like a ton of attachments. So a lot of these attachments that you see on your cases, you wouldn't need them if you're using a different aligner company. So um, don't get all hung up in the attachments because sometimes they're on there just to hold the darn thing in. Also, on one case you might need a lot and others you don't just because of the shape of the teeth or the height of the clinical crown. So for the most part, honestly, I let the, I try not to overstep um, kind of bossing the technicians around with attachments unless I really don't like it. I let them do their thing. And then if I look at it and it doesn't make sense, I'll ask for things. Um, what else? Number three. Um, I always put attachments on for extrusions of incisors, you know, um, upper and lower front teeth, um, canines too, because there's often not a height of contour and it needs something to grab onto. So if it's got a blue dot or a black dot, or if I even see extrusion, I'm going to ask for one. Um, for a flat tooth. What else? Um, I always put attachments on for rotations of incisors or premolars. If it's only oh, canines too, pretty much everything. If it's more than 15, 20 degrees. So I just ask for one because it's just going to be much more efficient. You can also ask for full sized attachments. Um, full size vertical, full size horizontal. Full size vertical would be for extrusions. Full size, excuse me, full size horizontal would be for extrusions. Full size vertical would be um, for rotations um, power ridges because we're talking about auxiliaries too are those little i don't know they're like nubs that go in to the towards the tooth actually touch the tooth unlike a nub that goes out that would be a bite tab i use bite tabs all the time for basically anyone with a deep bite is going to get a bite tab anyone with bruxism is going to get a bite tab anyone that clenches is going to get a bite tab you're not necessarily going to know that by looking at their at their case you're going to you mean it only takes a couple of posterior open bite cases to realize how wonderful bite tabs are. So I tend to use bite tabs all the time and they're not going to put them on unless you ask for them. You have to ask for bite tabs. They're not going to end up in your treatment plan if you don't ask for them. So you've got to know when to ask for them. I tend to underuse them um, instead of overuse them, um, but I should use them more. Every time I don't put one on and later I kick myself that I didn't put it on. Uh, but yeah, power ridges are the nubs that go in there for torquing a single tooth. They also cause the plastic to jet out and they cause more um, 
um, discomfort with the patient in terms of fit, fish, fit issues. So if you don't need one, um, don't put one on. Chewies, chewies are super duper important. Um, you need chewies to fully engage your attachments. If you're not spending the $1 on chewies and giving one to every patient and explaining patients that they need to use them regularly and how to use them, you are not getting the best possible outcomes. And again, look at your revision or refinement rate. If your revision or refinement rate is above 40, 50%, you're doing something wrong. So um, Chewies is a $1 thing that you can buy at Amazon. Give your patient one, explain the why behind it. I've got a bazillion videos on how to use Chewies and how that $1 investment can help you decrease your, not only your chair time, but increase patient satisfaction, your lab bills, everything like that. Um, you know, less chair time, less visits to the office is more ROI for you, um, you know, more profit. Because every time there's a patient in your chair, you're getting less profit, right? Because that chair could be used for something else. Precision cuts and elastics. I pretty much stopped using their recommended pre precision cuts, the slots, and now I'm all about just bonding to the tooth. You know, almost like you do in braces. It just works way, way, way better. Um, I know it's an extra step but it is so much better for adjusting midlines and um, adjusting AP. So you can ask for that. Um, I always say just all cut, no, all cutouts, no slots. Um, and of course, you know, it's an extra few minutes in the chair, but you'll get a way, way better um, outcome. And you can use heavier elastics. Um, and also there's less fit issues because if you're attaching your elastic to the slots, um, it's not, it's like a counterforce to seating it. You know, it's like the opposite of a chewy. So. Ideally, we want the darn things to stay in and not have something pulling them out all the time. Um, lastly, I think plastic is better than braces on open bite cases. Opposite, maybe on deep bite cases, unless you have the bite turbos. Um, I love plastic for open bite cases. You can do magical things, but remember, open bites don't just happen. I mean, you gotta figure out what is the etiology of your open bite, and this is something that I say so often. Your open bite is either caused by a past or present habit or it's caused by a skeletal issue, one or the other. So your past or present habit could be a thumb habit, a finger habit, a tongue habit, um, an oral habit, just biting fingers, biting pens, um, could be an airway issue, could be mouth breathing. The problem is you can go and fix it with Invisalign, but it's not going to retain. You're going to, first of all, it's going to take longer if you don't fix it first. And then I can't tell how often we see cases that just unravel. They don't retain, even though you might have made the best possible retention and the patient's wearing it because the force of the tongue is something to be reckoned with. The tongue is extremely strong and it's stronger than your retention. Even if you do bonded retainer, even if you don't Essex over it, most likely it's stronger. And you're going to see rapid relapse in these cases you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months. And most likely you're gonna to have to retreat that case for free because you missed the most important part, which is treating the myofunctional. And that's not always easy. Now treating the myofunctional could be, could mean having a myofunctional therapist. It could mean putting in a fixed appliance for six months ahead of time. It could mean putting in a removal appliance and having them wear it at night over the aligners. There's a lot of different options there. It could mean sending them to an ENT. It could mean um, taking some time and fixing the mouth breathing, finding what's wrong with the nasal airway, treating the allergies. There's a lot of stuff that may not be dentally related that comes with these open bite cases. So you're going to have to have an interdisciplinary approach, uh, which might include the primary care physician, physician or referring them out to a sleep um, physician um, or an ENT. So don't necessarily take an open bite case. Anytime you see an open bite case, as far as I'm concerned, it's a huge red flag. It may not be something that you want to start right then until you figure out what's causing it and you treated that. Now you could start the case and treat that first, but I wouldn't necessarily start the aligner until you figured out what the problem is. And if somebody's claiming there's no problem, then you're not doing your detective work well enough. You have to be a detective with these cases and find out what's wrong and treat it. Something is 100% causing it. And even if they tell you that they had a thumb habit at age five, well, if you still see an open bite, I don't buy that because a thumb habit at age five that ended at five doesn't cause an adult open bite. It would have fixed itself or, you know, it's not gonna be something that's totally obvious, you know? So that means that maybe they're mouth breathing at night because of the thumb habit they had at age five and it's a perpetual problem and that's still gonna unravel your case. So again, if you can visualize an open bite, there's something currently wrong. Could have been caused by a past problem, but there's still something currently wrong that needs to be treated. Often patients are totally unaware 
that things are happening at night and that the things that are happening at night is making their bite worse. And often they're not telling you the truth. I can't tell you how many patients are thumb suckers, active habits, biting fingers, biting nails, you know, stuff like that, even sucking thumbs at age 60, 70, 80. And nobody knows. They don't, it's a complete shame spiral. They're not gonna tell you in the chair. You're gonna have to dig into it and dig into it in a very friendly way and explain the why behind it and just say, hey, you know, in those circumstances, I say, look, I know you want to straighten your teeth, but I can't straighten your teeth till I find out what's causing your open bite. And unless I can find what's causing your open bite and treat that, I can't fix your teeth because anything I do is just going to relapse. And I don't want you to invest your money in something and have it go away, you know, even though we've both done our best job. So I need you to be totally honest with me about what's going on here and that, you know, usually they'll open up after that. So there's some good scripting for you. But again, sometimes they don't know. So... Anyways, hopefully that was helpful for you. Please do visit my site and go to the blogs to learn more. And don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. All right, thanks so much. Hey, it's Dr. Amanda with Street Smile Solutions, streetsmilesolutions.com. And I had a question come in yesterday from a doctor who was gonna be doing bonding some um, buttons on for Invisalign. And they had some questions about how much adhesive to put on the back of the button. And it's a fantastic question. And the other question they had was about positioning of the button with the aligner. And I don't necessarily have the best demo for that. I'll look around and see what I have, but um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So let me go ahead and show you real quick what we have and how to do it. So. Um, First of all, let's talk about bonding buttons. You can see here that, oops, I don't know if this is blurry or not. Let's see. I'm trying to get it. Okay, so for example, there's a precision cut or a button cutout right here. Can you see that? It's like a little half moon shape cutout. You're, all you're gonna do is put your attachment template on, or if you're doing your buttons not at delivery at the same time as attachments, <clears throat> excuse me, using my voice, um, whenever you're starting the buttons, you know, whenever this half moon comes, you're going to slap it on, make sure it's seated fully with chewies. If it's not fully seated, you cannot do it, okay, because it's not going to go on right. And then all you're going to do is center that button on the tooth, not right at the gum, not right at the top, but right in the middle. So you should have at least a millimeter all the way around because if somehow it wasn't fully seated, you'd be knocking it off. If you put it down by the gum line, it would be kind of moist and it wouldn't stick good, right? And if just use your normal isolation to do this, I mean, whatever system you want, personally, my personal preference is, um, no, don't use flowable. Do not use flowable, that's not gonna work. Use bracket cement, and there's a zillion different types of bracket cement. This is actually not my favorite, but this is just a bracket cement, which should be fine. But the one I like is called Transbond. Also, anything by Reliance is great. So Transbond is by 3 Immunitech. Reliance is great. Their stuff is really, really good. They're like top of the line for adhesive and bonding to teeth. But for demonstration purposes, this should be fine. But, you know, just the normal stuff, you're going to use your etch, right? Your blue etch, unless you have a porcelain crown. And hopefully if you had a porcelain crown, you did not <laughs> put a button on that tooth. You hopefully planned in advance and requested not one. Um, but for standard teeth, blue etch, right? Etch for 15, 20 seconds. Rinse, change the cotton rolls, air dry till chalky. So the tooth is chalky, keep it isolated. Don't let it get unchalky. Then put on your primer. Some primers um, are AB. Some primers is just one step. You're gonna scrub, read your directions because you're most likely gonna have to scrub your primer in. Sometimes you have to air thin. Sometimes you have to um, light cure. So you need to read your directions. They're all different. Sometimes you have to mix. Wouldn't recommend going to the lollipop one step whole process until you get the things down because there's a lot of errors that can happen in that process and you're not gonna know, right? Um, you should definitely watch my video on bracket breakage too, because if you're having breakage, there's probably an error in your step, right? So etch, rinse, dry, chalky, prime, however the prime thing is. Um, and then go ahead and get your bracket and get ready. So it doesn't matter if you're using a bracket. You can even use a bracket, but sometimes it doesn't fit very well with the half moon shape, right? But whatever works. Um, depends on how big the tooth is. Or you can use a button. This is actually an eyelet, but for demonstration purposes, it'll work just fine. Um, I'll show you how much glue to put on if I can open this. Oh goodness, okay. I should have pre-opened this before we started. Oh goodness. Okay, we're gonna do the bracket. Okay, hang on. So I'm gonna go ahead and get it out. I'm gonna show you how much glue to put on. 
Oh, these are some big brackets. Okay, these probably would actually not work um, for the half moon shape, but at least you can see how much glue to put on a bracket. Okay, so whenever you use bracket cement, um, of course you wanna get a bracket holder, it's better than a hemostat, because when you use a hemostat, you have to click it, and then it kind of shakes it. So I'd rather use a bracket holder. Um, whenever you get the glue, you wanna get your pad or whatever and dispense a little bit out first because the top part sometimes is dry and that's not gonna stick good. There we go. So I smear a little bit out first until it's sticky. Yep, it's sticky, so you're good. Okay, so all you're gonna do, and again, don't use flowable, okay? So all you're gonna do is just smear a little bit on the back of here and I'm kind of looking, sorry. I'm doing this in like a weird angle, so sorry if my hand's shaking, but I'm doing it through the lens. Is that enough? I can't even see. There's no light here. And yeah, remember you can't do it, um, you can't do it, well that's decent, that's actually too much. Okay, remember also you can't touch the back of your bracket because if you get the oils on it, it's not gonna stick. So if you think you touched it with your fingers, it's better to get a little rubbing alcohol and wipe it off, okay? Um, that's probably a little more than I need, but you know, better more than less, because when you push it down, so I'm gonna act like this is on the tooth right now. Actually, I can bond it to a tooth. Let me find a something to bond to. I always have stuff to bond to. Okay, let's bond to this. This is a model. Oh my goodness, there's like, the molars all have stuff. Not a good one. Okay, fine, same thing. So let's say, for example, this was a button, okay? But it's not. And we were gonna bond. You would just press it down. Okay, make sure you get it in the right position. But I mean, if you have a template on, if you have a template on, it's gonna basically show you what the position is. Like I said, don't be at the plastic don't be um, at the gum line, okay? And just press it down and whatever flash there is, you know, you can use a scaler and just wipe it away and light your. Now, if you're doing indirect bonding, um, different story, it's actually tipped, but because you really can't do the flash. So you just have to get your right amount of glue, you know, just a smear on the back of it and then press it down. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully you enjoyed this demo. Thanks so much. Hey, it's Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com, and today I want to talk about bonding either attachments or buttons to a crown tooth in Invisalign or really any type of aligners. Tricks, tips, should you do it, should you not do it? So let's first of all talk about should you do it. Well, if it's a relatively easy case, like a simple class one, mild to moderate crowding spacing, you should be able to bypass that tooth. So when you submit the case, you wanna make sure you block off any buttons or attachments being put on that tooth, because it shouldn't be a problem. Because theoretically, if it's a simple case, you don't even need attachments, they're just on there to expedite things, make them more efficient, etc. Now, if it's a much more difficult case, severe crowding and or has AP or transverse issues, vertical issues, you might need a, either a button for elastics or an attachment on that crown tooth. This is where it gets a little more complicated. If you don't think that you can do it without, and I hesitate because if you tell the treatment planners to do it without, they'll just come up with like a wing it treatment plan without it, but that doesn't mean it's possible. So you really have to run this by an orthodontist who's seen it, done it. They can really tell you if it's gonna be predictable without. Sometimes it is necessary to bond either an attachment, you know, like a handle to help to derotate a crooked tooth or help to extrude a tooth that need extrusion to a crown um, if it's a difficult movement. And sometimes you need a button. Buttons are different than attachments. Buttons are something that is put on externally. It's prefab. It has a cutout in the aligner and it's glued to the actual tooth. So it's not part of the aligner, it's not captured by the aligner, it's not under the aligner. There's a window in the attachment template and you will, the doctor will bond a button and you'll bond an elastic to it. So you hook an elastic to the button. So let's say for example, so this is say number 30, right? Or lower right six, oh, lower right seven, because that's lower right six, that's lower right eight. So this has a crown, this has a crown, right? So this is a crown, a crown is like a shell or a hat, a protective cover that you put on a tooth that either has had a big cavity or has had a root canal, right? Or like had a fracture or something to try to make it whole again. Here's the natural tooth, 
Here's the shell, okay? Crowns can be made out of generally three different things. Number one is gonna be porcelain or some type of porcelain or ceramic. Number two is gonna be gold. And number three is gonna be some type of tin can, garbage can, tin shell, stainless steel. Stainless steel alloy is a temporary, it's not a permanent. So I would not recommend doing any type of aligners or orca with a stainless steel on unless you're doing braces and you could always do a, a band over the stainless steel. Same thing with gold. You can do a band, a fitted band over the gold, but you can't bond to metal, okay? Not possible. Can't glue anything to bond to metal. Um, the only thing you could do is like literally drill a hole in the, in the crown and, and glue the bug tooth in there, but then cavity and leakage might get in there. So most likely you're not going to do that. If it is a porcelain, it really depends on what type of porcelain it is. And most likely you're not going to know until you go in there and try to bond to it. From my experience, the nicer, the shinier, the prettier the crown, the less it bonds. <laughs> so, which kind of stinks, right? So if it's a junky porcelain old um, crown, usually it bonds pretty well. Um, if it's a really shiny, beautiful, glazed new crown, um, zirconia, something like that, nope, it doesn't bond well. So sometimes you have to drill a hole in it, break the glaze. You, they do make kits, and the best possible kit that I've used is used by, is caused, caused by, it's made by a company called Reliance. Reliance, like to rely, Reliance. Um, all they do, Reliance Orthodontics only does orthodontics, and they have the best adhesive products, and they have a really good kit. I have a different video on that kit. Um, if you message me, I can send it to you. If not, you can go into my YouTube and just look up um, porcelain bonding kit or porcelain, and it'll show up. But um, they have really good how-to videos, step-by-step -step guides. I think their kit's like $100 or $200, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's going to last for many patients, um, and it is the best kit. If you can't get it to stick with that kit, then you're going to have to damage the crown. That's your two options, or change the treatment plan. So that's your three options. So these are things, if your patient has a lot of crowns and it has a really hard case, you're going to want to have that conversation before you even start treatment. I recommend grabbing a written disclaimer that just basically says, hey, look, we're going to probably have to damage a few of your crowns in order to get these brackets to stick. If we damage them, it's not gonna be covered by insurance. It's just additional part of treatment and you're gonna to have to pay to replace them at an additional expense later after treatment, you know? It's just how it is. So, you know, it's the benefit of having natural teeth in ortho. So grab that signature because if you do not, when you get to the end of the treatment, guess who's paying for the crowns? The doctor's paying for the crowns if the doctor damaged them and didn't grab the release from the patient. So just a little suggestion. Anyways, that's pretty much it. All right, hopefully that was helpful, thanks. So before we begin, I wanna make sure that you know how to get a hold of me, how to ask questions after the show. Um, please do go to my website, straightsmilesolutions.com. I wanna show you a couple of new features that are on there that maybe you didn't know about. If you go to the homepage, and this is this, um, I'm gonna start with number one, if you see number one up there. There is a button for a free 20 minute consultation. Now we're not gonna be going over in any cases in that. Um, we're just gonna be talking about your practice, how we can optimize it, um, finding ways to be more efficient, just talking about different orthodontic systems. You can utilize that 20 minute consultation however you want. I offer every dentist in the world, I know that's a big, <laughs> big stretch, and Dental Labs too, a free 20 minute consultation. Just jump on there and you can schedule it. It's super easy, no need email. Um, number two, if you're interested in being a subscriber, our prices are actually really low. Um, so I've been told I purposely keep them low. I have not raised them at all because I want to be able to service people um, in underserved countries, dentists there. I want it to be reasonable and affordable for everybody. So um, that's my goal. We have things as little as like one session. We can go over like one case or you can have an unlimited subscription. Listen, if you're just doing like one case every three months, it pretty much covers it. But we help you with, depending on your level of service, pretty much everything that you need help on. So um, you probably don't know that you need help until we find out what you can do that you need help. So definitely sign up today. We do take only a limited amount of concierge doctors at a time. I'm not going to tell you how many. I do have a few other orthodontists that do work with me um, if I need to, to have additional help. Um, but right now, um, I will try to be your assigned concierge provider, um, but it is limited. So um, I would highly recommend that you start there. Do visit our FAQ session if you have any questions. Okay, number three, bottom left, it's a little camera. And this is called SmileSnap. So SmileSnap is a virtual consultation tool. 
listen, I'm not seeing patients, but they were super cool and they let me use it for a few months. So you guys can play with it. So I installed it. It was so easy. The code just drops right in, installed it on my computer. You can go ahead and play with it. You can change the verbiage. So I was kind of using it. Um, if you guys want to communicate with me about a case, but you can use it in your own way. Um, so you should totally check it out for now. Feel free to play with it and, and just do whatever. And then on the other end, there's a dashboard. So, um, Theoretically, I can probably show it to you if you want to do a screen share. But anyways, they'll be glad to do a demo. If you want an introduction, let me know. All right. And last thing, number four, you may not be able to see that up in the top right, there's a portal. This is our HIPAA compliant portal. If you are a client, you'll have access to this. Every client gets access to their own HIPAA compliant portal. That's how we submit our cases. If you want really fast responsiveness, we have a couple other ways. But there's about 30 different ways that we can use to communicate. So we'll find the right way for you and we'll go over all the options with you, okay? And then don't forget, don't forget, we are launching our digital education series, not only digital, but we have like hands-on like destination where you can go someplace and learn. We have hands-on, you can do it on your own time, digital, but you will get um, actually a physical kit that you can learn to practice different types of orthodontic movements and education. This is totally customized for you, this is new. We literally launched this officially to, well, last week. But you can go to our website if you want information. Um, it's because it's customized, the price point's also customized. So if you're interested, let me know what part you're interested in and I'll go ahead and send you that information. Hey, what's up? This is Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com. And today we're gonna be talking about class two and class three elastics with aligners. And what to do if you're not using Invisalign. Obviously, if you are using Invisalign, it's significantly easier. Here's an example of what their precision cuts look like. You can see here, can you see it on the canine? I'm gonna go ahead and hook that on for you. Now in terms of what elastics to use, you're gonna really have to try them in your patient and see there's no wrong or right answer to this and it really depends on the morphology of the teeth and the bite. So let me show you what this looks like, see? This would be for a class two elastics, it just hooks right on there and then down on the bottom, it's gonna go ahead and hook to the lower molar. You can use either the first or the second molar. You could either use a button or you can use precision cut to precision cut. So many, many options. It really depends on your personal preference. So we're gonna go ahead and show you a diagram shortly about that. If you're gonna go from button to button, you can do that too, actually. You can probably use heavier elastics. You might be able to use 316 heavy or even possibly 1 8 heavy. If you're going from precision cut to precision cut, it's gonna be a little bit different. In that case, oh, let me do that for you. I'm gonna set one up for you. You're gonna to have to use a lighter elastic. You know, in that case, it's gonna be a little more challenging because you are gonna to have to um, make sure that they're not getting displaced. So let me show you kind of what that looks like. And this is, I'm using a combination of clear correct and Invisalign. But, so that's going from, slot to slot, okay? So that means the patient is gonna go ahead and assemble this outside the mouth and then put it in their mouth all at one time. As opposed to going from button to button where you're gonna put the aligners in first, the buttons will already be on the teeth and then hook the elastics on. So personal preference, what you wanna do. What if you wanna go ahead and punch your own precision cuts? Now, again, we showed the demo of Invisalign what it looks like. The good thing about Invisalign is because of their scallop trim, it's super easy to put the hook on and they're relatively low profile. If you're gonna punch in your own, it gets a little bit uglier and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about because if there is no scallop trim, when you try to punch in your own, it's not gonna work. So you're gonna have to like create your own slot. So let me show you what this looks like. You have to play with it a little bit, but this is for the class two. You can see here. So what I was using to do that was, um, I'm gonna give credit where credit's due. So the pliers that I was using, these are made by Justenko. It's a company out of Sweden, and you can see here, this is the slot puncher. I have a couple other videos on that. If your aligners have straight line trim, like Clear Correct or some of the other in-house aligner, white label companies, you are gonna have to get creative with your punching. This is how you punch, do the molar punch out. That's a little bit easier. You can see here, I'll show you what that looks like. So here's where I did a molar punch out down here, okay? And really, I would put it on the patient first, you know, and just kind of mark where you wanna do it. It needs to be in the center of the clinical crown, and you need to be able to get the whole button on there and a tiny bit of enamel along the gingival so that it's not 
kind of seeping on the gingival as you blonde it because it's probably not going to stay on. So you need to make sure you make it high enough. This is probably an example of not how not to do it because it's a little bit off center and I think not high enough. So I'll try to reposition that for you. But um, okay, so let's talk about the opposite. So here we go. I'm popping it right now. Woo, that's a little bit better. Okay, maybe a little bit more centered. Okay. What if you want to do a class three elastic? Class three elastic is the opposite. So you're going from, and we'll go ahead and show you a diagram now. We're going from um, upper molar, so you can either do the six or the seven, so you have to think about that, uh, to the lower canine for the most part. So it's opposite, right? So upper molar to the lower canine. Let's see if we got one punched out here. Nope, yes. So here. This is actually an upper now. <laughs> we just turned it into an upper. So there's your upper molar cutout, or you can do a slot. I'll make a slot for you right now. You can see how to do that. Again, these are not the prettiest, but I do find that when you have a straight line trim, you're kind of at a disadvantage for this. You really are. Um, let's do that here. Sorry, I'm not really doing it in front of you guys, but okay. So I kind of ran it to the seven here, but here this is for class three so upper molar slot down to lower canine if you want to go slot to slot you're gonna to have to go lighter on elastics if you want to go um button to button you can go heavier on elastics again the elastics i'm usually using are on the small end is going to be your one eighth medium to one eighth heavy on that larger end maybe three sixteenths to maybe one quarter depends on the morphology of the teeth the bite uh, the patient's musculature, so many things. So you really need to try in the elastics before the patient leaves the office and make sure that they can comfortably get them on and get them off in a timely manner. I'm gonna give them about one or two minutes. If they can't do it in two minutes, meh, you know, either have them practice more or change the elastic size. If they cannot do it, then they're not gonna do it at home because I mean, and you guys should be able to do it too, I'll be honest. I mean, initially, unless you have nails, you're probably gonna use one of these to put the elastics on. But if you can't do it with your nails, the patient can't do it with their nails, okay? So, and the patient's not gonna take this home. I mean, there's elastic hook, things that you can use it, but realistically, is the patient gonna carry that around? No. So make sure it's something that you can do before you assign it to your patient. In order for elastics to work, some tips, you have to wear them 24 seven, 24 seven. Maybe you could have them out maximum two hours per day while you eat. If they are only wearing them 18 hours a day, it will not work. You will get zero outcome on this. So you, it's like a seesaw effect. It's just gonna be sore. That's the only thing that's gonna happen. So you have to make sure that your patient understands this 24 seven. And not just two weeks, three weeks, you're talking about months to get, I would say uh, if they wear it aggressively, um, and you did right by your sizing, you should see about a half millimeter to a millimeter a month of AP change. By AP change, I mean the bite correcting um, from the anterior posterior direction. That means if they have a seven millimeter overjet, it's going to take at least seven, mil you know, seven months to correct that. I mean, that's even on the max. I don't know, in an adult, if you're gonna get that much correction, that's maybe in a kiddo. In an adult, the max you're gonna get with elastics is probably two to three millimeters of correction, and that's if they're awesome. In a kid, maybe you can get up to six to seven millimeters, and that's if they're awesome. But like I said, that's gonna take minimum seven months of 24 seven wear. When the patient comes in for their checks, you need to be measuring them and taking photos. You should see, if you're only seeing them every six to eight weeks, and they're honestly wearing these 24 seven, you'll see a change. If you don't see a change, they didn't wear them. So, and you need to be confident in telling them that. So, I mean, a little confidence with elastic goes a long way, because, um, you know, <laughs> patients or kids are like, animals, they can sniff out fear and it's a lack of self-confidence. So you need to have the confidence. But again, if you didn't size the elastics right, guess what? It's not going to work. So it all comes down to whether you sized it right. So hopefully I didn't blow your mind too much with these instructions, but there's an art to wearing elastics and there's an art to getting a good outcome. So any questions, feel free, send your questions our way, straightsmilesolutions.com. We'll be glad to help you with aligners and elastics wear. All right. Thanks so much. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hi, it's Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about 
um, elastics, specifically class two and class three elastics with Invisalign or aligners and how it's different from braces. And please watch my previous video about the elastics where I talk about um, how to put them on, how to use your elastic placement tool if you need it, where to order it, how to wear class two and class three elastics with braces. But let's talk about how it's different with aligners. So you might get buttons put on your teeth and have the elastics anchored to the buttons and the aligners will go on top. And that's actually my preferred way because I find when you, the other way is where you anchor them to the aligners themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you have to use a lighter elastic to do that because they are actually hooked to the, um, to the aligner and if you use too heavy an elastic it can pop it out right when you when you yawn or something like that but if it is hooked to your um aligner you're gonna have a little bitty hook on it and now i'm looking for the hook to see if i can find it and this one doesn't have it okay so we call those precision cuts do i have one on here yeah kind of so let me show you what the button cutout looks like first this is invisalign okay so button cutout is going to look like this see how it's like a half moon shape and then the button gets bonded on your tooth and this just goes over it it's like a little window okay and if you have one of the little hooks to hook it to oh, hmm. button cutout button cutout well okay I made one here, so we'll use the one that it looks more like a little like wedge is chipped out of the thing, okay? And then you just go ahead and slide the elastic over it, okay, like this, see that? And it'll go to your aligner, but that has to be a lighter elastic because it also can cause fit issues because it's constantly wanting to pull it out. So that's not my preference. I prefer to anchor it to the tooth itself. So same concept as with braces, whether you're gluing it to the teeth or you're hooking it to the aligners, ultimately up to your doctor. My preference is to go ahead and bond it to the teeth. That way I can use heavier elastics and I can do it quicker. But good question for you to talk to your doctor about if you have any questions. All right, thanks so much. Hey, this is Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions. And today I'm super excited to announce that white label aligners, clear aligners, in-house aligners can now be done with precision cuts. And as you can see here, we have a window here, we have a hook here. Of course, you can switch it around. This is the class two orientation. Class three is going to go like this. Um, just so excited that there is a company now that is going to be integrating precision cuts. Of course, anytime you do precision cuts, um, you need to know what you're doing. <laughs> this is a, it's a little more complicated. So if you have any questions, please watch my other videos. But this is so great. I mean, it's just so great for orthodontists, for dentists who are doing aligners that this option is now available. We're going to be able to take more complex cases, lower our lab fees. And I think right now where finances are super critical and overhead and lab fees and um, just having cash flow in your practice, not paying that gigantoid lab fee up front is huge. You know, the cool thing with white label is that you don't have to, the only thing you're paying up front is that, is that setup lab fee, which for this company, which is global that I work with is $90. So that's the only thing you have to pay from there. You can batch your aligners, print them in batches. Um, you can do it in-house, um, or you can send to a lab which will punch these for you i think it's a tiny bit extra per aligner normally it's about 15 dollars per aligner but it's a little extra if they're going to be punching the cuts um, but that is really quite reasonable so um i'm excited about this so if you want to hear more um i'd be glad to introduce you uh, there are a few options out there besides invisalign that now offer precision cuts so glad to tell you more about the different options all right thanks so much Hey, it's Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com. And today we're going to address where do you buy buttons for Invisalign elastics or precision cuts? And that is pretty easy. It really depends on if you want metal ones or ceramic ones. The plastic ones don't tend to work very well. Um, I've had really good luck with the ceramic ones that you buy from the Invisalign store. So if you just go to, you log into your Invisalign account and go to the store, they're kind of expensive. Thinking they're $40, $50 for 10, it's about five bucks a button, but they work, they stick on. If you just want a metal one, they come in various shapes and sizes. You can't get a gigantoid one because it may not fit within the little half moon shape, but I mean, you can even just go to eBay or any orthodontic company, you know, um, from Henry Schein to um, 
ortho organizers to ormco to all these different ones they're always changing names so i'm forgetting but they all have them just google um, orthodontic button metal or orthodontic button ceramic and it'll come up and you'll you'll get your favorites in time so no worries on that just yeah not plastic would be my suggestion and it's got to have a pretty good mesh base not it shouldn't be just smooth all right thanks so much This is Dr. Amanda from Straight Smile Solutions, and today we're going to be talking about fixing overjets, or as some people call them, overbites. Really, an overjet is where your front teeth are ahead of your lower teeth, or your lower jaw might be a little bit small, different ways of describing it. So let's talk about the best way to fix this, and the reason why I'm launching this series is because I get a lot of questions from just consumers, parents who just don't understand like they're getting different recommendations from friends um, from other doctors from orthodontists from their general dentist and they don't understand what's best and yeah it's really confusing so let's talk about let's just get kind of the straight story on what the different options are what your doctor might be telling you and I can't say what the best way to fix a child's bite is without you know examining them in my office but in any case, I just want to explain the different options to you so that you have the power to ask the right questions. Okay, so here in this infographic, you're going to basically it's just saying, is it better to do appliances or is it better to use rubber bands? Of course, another option might be jaw surgery, but I, that's way down the road. Nobody wants that. So basically, there's going to be two main camps in order to fix this. So camp number one is who I describe as the doctors or the parents that believe in early skeletal correction. Now, I know that sounds weird because I'm saying skeletal. That's not a skeleton. It just means finding the source of the problem. And if the source of the problem is having a jaw discrepancy, like the lower jaw just genetically didn't grow appropriately to the right size, this could be genetic, it could be environmental, it could be the way a child slept or habits that they have, resting their hand on their chin in class, lots of different things, um, thumb sucking, lots of things can hold that jaw back, okay? So what we're saying here is maybe one option is to go ahead and stimulate the growth of the lower jaw to correct the bite discrepancy while you still can, while the bones still have that genetic predisposition to, it's a big word, to grow correctly. So that's early skeletal correction. And that's one camp. A lot of orthodontists are totally in this camp. A lot of pediatric dentists are totally in this camp. A lot of pediatricians are totally in this camp. It's natural. It's healthy. It's the way it's meant to be. Of course, I'm a big fan of this. You can hear me talking about it. This usually must, though, this is the key, must be done between the ages of around 6, 7, 8, 9, could be 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. But you really have to dial in to the skeletal maturity of the child. Um, you can check with the pediatrician. There's a lot of indicators for skeletal growth. This could be a whole nother series, how to find this out. You can read x-rays, you can read hand wrist diagrams, you can read the cervical age, the age of the bones in the um, upper part of the backbone. So many different things that you can do, okay? Option number two is to wait until the child's in regular braces, comprehensive braces or aligners, and to fix it with rubber bands. Could be rubber bands, could also be something like a Jasper jumper, a Herbst, all kinds of little pistony devices, Amara, all different synonyms for this, okay? But basically what we call this is dental alveolar correction. And basically that's a fancy word of saying, we're tipping the teeth to make the teeth match up. We're not fixing the jaw, we're tipping the teeth, okay? So we're leaning the lower teeth forward or pop, like pushing the upper teeth back to get them to match up better. Overall outcome, I'm not gonna say it's the same because it's not the same, but the overall outcome is yes, the bite will appear corrected, it'll function correctly, but how it got there is different and the way it may look on the, your face when you turn a profile view may look different. Maybe you like that look, maybe you don't like that look, but I think you have to understand the difference because if you wait too long and decide to go with the late dental alveolar correction, too late where the maybe the girl has already finished her skeletal growth, this could be as early as age 
eight or nine in a girl where you're already outside that window of where it's possible to get skeletal correction and your only choice now is either dental alveolar correction or a jaw surgery so it is not much you can do in that case so that's why i think it's important that all parents when we start to see a discrepancy in the bite are given options and i really really encourage every single general dentist and every single pediatric dentist and every single pediatrician to educate themselves on what the different options are so that they can give each parent a choice on how they want to treat their child and what the risks, benefits, and alternatives are. That's pretty much all I wanted to say here. We can dig more into this later if you want to talk about rubber bands, you want to talk about the different appliances to correct bites. There's so many different appliances. All of them work slightly differently, but all of them are just about the same, ultimately. So fixing bones or tipping teeth. Hey, it's Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, and today we're gonna to be talking about the My Phase One Smile Index. It is like a little screening questionnaire that we created about a year ago. Um, it's something that we give out to our clients with Straight Smile Solutions. Um, anytime they ask, um, we support them to use this. If you are not a client, um, we will be selling it, kind of like an ebook um, for a small fee. Um, how you choose to use it is how you choose to use it. Basically, it has about two pages of screening questions and it'll automatically calculate the points. Um, at a certain level of points, it's strongly recommended that you start with phase one treatment on the patient once the patient is seven or eight. Um, the lower the points, the less crucial it is. It's not always cut or dry with phase one. It's just a recommendation. Um, as you've seen my other videos, you know that the goal of phase one is to set the patient up for success so that, I mean, there's always a chance with phase one that you might not have to do phase two or that it won't be medically necessary at least. If you get the bite just right, the arch is expanded the way they're supposed to be, um, grow the jaw to the way it's supposed to be, um, then often you don't need to do phase one, or at least there might be some very minor, you know, rotation, something very cosmetic that could be optional at a later date. Um, so the goal, of course, with phase one is to get the arch width ideal so that the teeth have space to be successful and grow in. You know, if you build it, they will come. Um, to, of course, grow a maxilla if it's underdeveloped, grow a mandel if it's underdeveloped, improve the airway. Um, of course, cosmetics is an issue as well. Function, the ability to proper, to properly eat, bite, and stuff like that. Um, eliminate habits, everything like that. So, um, yeah, we've always given out this index to any of our clients, um, as just a part of what we do. Um, if you're not a straight smile solutions client and you'd like to try this index, um, we will now be basically selling it like an ebook. So you can just purchase it. Um, no instructions, uh, basically use it as you see fit. If you'd like to have some tutorial or some instructions behind it, we are glad to teach you as well. And we'd be glad to talk to you a little bit more about that. So let's talk a little bit more about phase one. We've already talked about it a little bit. Here's some of the price points that I recommend for that, for your practice. If you're gonna do phase one, most likely you're gonna need a second phase two later. Whether you choose to keep the phase two in your house or not, in your office or not, you can always decide that later. Um, I love the idea of pediatric dentists doing phase one because it's a small commitment that you can handle. And then later, if it looks, everything comes in like you planned really well, you can always do the phase two later. Remember, insurance is probably only going to pay once. So if you wipe out the insurance in phase one, there's no <laughs> bigger way to piss off a parent than all of a sudden telling them, by the way, you owe me $5,000 for phase two. You know, and by the way, insurance is going to cover that. They will be furious. So you need to be really, really clear with the patient, with the parent. If you're going to use the, uh, the insurance now in phase one, it might cover the whole thing or most of it. But later they're going to, if they need phase two, which is likely that they'll need something need in quotes, it may not maybe a little bit more cosmetic, less functional, it may not be something they have to do immediately. But most likely, they're going to need a little bit. And it could just be a few express aligners, but we can't predict the future. All we can do is set things up for success. So in comparison, comprehensive is one go do it all in one go. But remember, right now with phase one, you're trying to harness the growth during the pre pubertal, you know, pubertal phase. And this can happen in a girl at eight, nine, 10, and often does happen by nine, 10. 
And they may only have eight permanent teeth in at that point. So you really now more than ever need to be doing phase one so that you can harness the growth. If you wait for comprehensive until they're done growing, you're not going to get a good outcome. So it's really important to understand that and understand growth a little bit more. Here's some of the options that you can do um, in terms of appliances for phase one in your office. You don't have to do them all, but these are just suggestions. Expanders, expanders come in all different forms. Um, myofunctional trainers, um, distalizers, ways to upright teeth, habit appliances. I'm not a huge fan of headgear, um, not this kind of headgear, but I like the protraction face mask that moves the upper jaw forward. That's great for class three, that works really well and growth modification devices. Um, I mentioned the My Phase One Smile Index. That is something, again, if you contact me before Sunday evening, tomorrow, um, I'll be glad to email that to you. You'll need to email us directly and you can go to our website to do that. And I will send you a copy of that. Normally there's a fee for that. It's a free um, screening form that is used uh, by our clients, but I'll be glad to give it to you. And actually I thought it was going to be on my page to upload, but it didn't show up. So same thing with our hand wrist x-ray analysis form. We created this. Uh, we found an easy way that we just created on our own. This is copyright um, to be able to screen your patients, to know their growth. Um, super awesome. A lot of pediatricians love our form. And it's something that you could actually bring this if you wanted to, to your pediatrician. What a great way to network um, and to get more, more clients. We've talked a lot about phase one, expanders, different types of expanders, RPEs. Um, great way to develop the arches to fix certain types of bites, deep bites, open bites. And you can even build all kind of blinging them to help with overjets. Last two, correction, okay. Um, overjet correction. We're going to be talking about twin block therapy. And twin block is a key appliance I like to use in growing kids. Now, if you want success with this appliance, and this is the lower and this is the upper, okay, you need to pick your patient wisely. By picking your patient, first of all, you need to pick a patient who has overjet, of course. I'll show you like a good patient. Okay, so this is what this patient looks like. Okay, this is a great patient for twin block therapy. You know, half to a full cusp class two, growing patient, has overjet, in mix dentition, not permanent dentition. What else? Um, in terms of skeletal maturity, you need to do a skeletal maturity assessment, okay? So that means you need to measure and make sure your patient is still growing. How do you do that? You can't just guess. You can't just say, are you still growing? Because this thing is not going to work, and this is going to be a complete waste of time if you do not choose wisely. So the best way that I like to do this, and you can ask a lot of questions, but is to go ahead and do a hand wrist analysis. And I've done a separate video on this. Um, if you have a Ceph plate, it's very easy to do. If you do not have a Ceph plate and you can't do this, then you're gonna to need to ask a lot of questions about skeletal maturity, where they are in the puberty process. Um, they need to be barely started, you know, on the early end, not already completed. Um, they shouldn't have had their, their menses, they shouldn't have their voice changed, they shouldn't have anything like that, not even close, okay? if you want this to work well. So also let's talk about psycho psychosocially, what is the ideal patient for this? So I don't like to do these kind of appliances that can be a little bit bulky in a patient who is in junior high. They need to be still in elementary school. So you need to ask the questions, don't assume because they're in sixth grade that they're in elementary school, they may be in middle school. So this is best in a third, fourth or fifth grade, okay? Even second grader any of the above. You can do this very young. It is not at all going to work in junior high because you can see how bulky, I mean, even though from the front, you can barely see it. You know, this is what it looks like from the front. So that part is nice and it is in two pieces, unlike your bionators and your Frankel twos and other things that are in one piece and really affect speech. Um, but it's still a little bit bulky. There's some acrylic blocks on it and vertically, you know, they're going to be talking and it's their speech is gonna be a little bit different. People will notice, people will be asking what's in your mouth. They can practice, they can probably get 90% improvement with speech, but people will still know. And it kind of gives you a little bit of a long face appearance. So even though this isn't permanent in junior high, it's just not gonna get worn. It's not. I don't care how great the kid is, it's just social suicide. So pick your patient wisely, right? So we said mixed dentition, 
just starting puberty or early in the puberty process, third, fourth, or fifth grade. Um, Skeldily hasn't gone even close through puberty left yet. And we're going to leave this in actually about a year, nine months to a year. It's going to be in a pretty darn long time. So you need to make sure it fits well. As new teeth come in and out, you have to be ready to adjust it um, as needed. Okay. So that's pretty much how it works. You're going to go ahead, take your impressions or your scans. You're going to ask for a twin block, these little acrylic blocks. Okay are going to keep the mandible positioned forward. So you can see how they're gonna have a little bit of an open, you know, open mouth like this. It's gonna give them a little bit of a different look. They're gonna talk a little funny, but this constant forward position of the mandible does encourage the mandible, a deficient mandible to grow over time. It's not just smoke and mirrors. It actually will grow if the patient does wear it. That means 24 seven for about nine months to a year, okay? If they don't wear it 24 seven, nine months to a year, work at all okay so then it's a waste of everyone's time so of course like with anything I tell you make sure you have your compliance paperwork in check make sure you've created a compliance program if you don't know what this is feel free to connect with me this is something that we do routinely with our concierge patients excuse me, concierge clients um, we help you set all this up so that you can do removable appliances and not get dinged if the patient isn't compliant like you have all your systems in place um, of course, you're not just going to let the patient go either. You're going to be having them check in. You're going to be measuring the overjet and making sure it's working. Within three months, if you don't see a kind of a noticeable change, they're not wearing it. So you might as well discontinue it, you know? So that's pretty much it. If the patient has a deep bite, you might need to do some modifications. That means you're probably going to want to draw some of the acrylic behind the block right here or some of the blocks behind the, um, the curved part, okay? so that the lower teeth can start to gently extrude. Same thing, you might want to take off a little bit under here, okay? Maybe even reduce it a little bit forward of the notch here. So slowly it can start to level out. But for the most part, this is a great appliance. If they do wear it for that nine to 12 months, you can anticipate three to four millimeters of jaw growth, um, which is a pretty sweet class two correction. Um, and the rest you can always get with elastics later in, the, in your braces or aligners. So this will reduce to eliminate, if you start early, the need for jaw surgery um, or tooth extractions. So that is the why behind the twin block. Hey, it's Dr. Amanda with Street Smile Solutions, streetsmilesolutions.com. And today I'm gonna talk to you about bionators. And bionators are definitely one of my go-to appliances for kids in the mixed dentition, kicks, kids with large overjets. The cool thing about bionators is that they can be customized, not only in terms of color, you know, so the patient feels like that they can design them, but also for various bite issues, whether, you know, you're trying to open a deep bite, try to close an open bite. Um, for the most part, bionators are used to advance a mandible. So I'm a huge fan, if you've heard my other videos, about forward donics, forward orthodontics, not moving things backwards, like, say, a Carrier, or a headgear or a distalizing appliance that's backwards. So to fix an overjet, if you're doing backwards orthodontics, you're taking the top jaw or the top teeth and moving them back. Um, we don't wanna do that. So especially if we look at a patient and we're looking at their profile and we're like, dude, this person has a really tiny mandible. You know, we're looking at the SAF, maybe we're looking at the airway thinking we need to do whatever we can do to open the airway, advance the mandible, not close the airway by retracting the top teeth or the top jaw. So that's why I love bionators. They're also very simple. Um, like I said, very easy to customize both in color and in design to get what you want with the bite. Of course, they're 100% compliance based, right? But timing and picking the right patient with the bionator is really critical. They just do magical stuff as long as they're worn. <laughs> and they really do need to be worn 22 hours a day, usually for I'd say nine to 12 months. So picking the right patient is key, explaining the why behind it. If they're only wearing it at night, it's not going to work. So they have to actually wear it to school. It is a one piece appliance. So um, like I said, these things have been around for a hundred years, you know, they're definitely much more sophisticated, but 
Um, there's different versions of them. They call them activators. There's all kind of trade names, but for the most part, they all lump into a classification of a mandibular advancement appliance. And I call them biomators. Bionators are the most generic version. You can order them from any ortho lab. You don't have to take a special class or anything like that. Lab fee is probably in the neighborhood of 200 ish, depending on how much you bling it out. Um, like I said, it's a one piece appliance. So you can figure if the patient's wearing it doesn't hurt or anything like that, but it's going to be a little tricky to learn to talk with it in because it does need to click in. Um, it's being made to, with the lower jaw set forward, almost like the way, if you know Invisalign, their mandibular advancement version, it's similar to that. Now, this is going to work way better, especially a mixed dentition than their MA. Um, but you want to do this when the patient is ideally still growing, you know, actively still growing or prepubertal even, um, eight, seven, eight, nine, 10. Um, you're probably not going to have a lot of success. And I, and I encourage you to ask a lot of questions as to where the kid goes to school, what grade they're in, what does a school district look like in your area? Once that patient's getting into junior high or middle school where they're around older kids, forget it. <laughs> it's not going to get worn. I can tell you it's not going to get worn. Because obviously it's going to work great in third, fourth, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade, depending on what school they go to. Um, but beyond that, don't bother. Um, you'll need to move on to something else. Um, but yeah, it can be definitely a phase one appliance or it can be part of your comprehensive treatment. You do this first. And then once you've had some jaw growth, then you can go ahead and put the braces or the aligners on. Um, or you can even move into... Invisalign MA, um, you know, and finish the, the treatment up with that. Hey, this is Dr. Amanda here from Street Smile Solutions, and I had some questions about sagittal expanders, or you can call them sagittal distalizers. So sagittals basically are very similar to an expander. They work exactly the same way in functionality and in mechanism, but basically it's a jack screw that's built into a removable appliance, not unlike a retainer, that can help to distalize a posterior segment of an arch. So for example here, you see maybe there was an early loss of a tooth and the space collapsed. Maybe there's a blocked out premolar. So you can see the jack screw that's right here. And the idea is that we're going to go ahead and deliver this appliance before we do braces or aligners, or maybe just only for this reason, maybe as a phase one kind of appliance or an interceptive appliance, to go ahead and distalize the posterior segment um, to open up space for the new tooth or to open up space for an implant or a bridge. Okay, so it works fundamentally the same way. You can get, I would say from my experience, up to two millimeters of space back. That's a lot of space, right? Um, the way I deliver it is I go ahead and deliver it. Um, usually I'm gonna do about one turn a week on the appliance and please follow my instructions from my expander videos, my RP videos on how to do a turn. I'm not gonna go over that today. If you don't know where that video is, you can message me and I will send it to you. It's in my library. Um, you can search under RPE and it should come up, okay? But you're gonna go ahead and turn in the direction of the arrows, do it at nighttime before bed, have the patient wear it. They do need to wear it 24 seven in order for this to be effective. That's pretty much it. So you're probably gonna end up doing, I mean, ultimately you're supposed to get 0.25 millimeters per turn. So you can do the math. You're always gonna lose some space. So you're probably going to end up doing, you're going to have to turn probably 30, 40, 50% more than you think you need. 15, 16, 17 turns. It's going to take a few months to open this up. What you're going to see is this segment distalize first, okay? And then if there's other teeth, they'll kind of, they're attached to the PDL, it'll start to come out with it. So anyways, that's pretty much how it works. I'm excited to show you sagittal. I do use them regularly and I recommend their use. And I think it's an easy way to get improvements without having to do fixed braces or to make your fixed braces easier. And the big question today that I get asked a lot is, is headgear bad? Does headgear work? Why, why are some orthodontists using headgear and some orthodontists refuse to use headgear? So let me tell you a little bit about headgear and what it has been used for historically and how things are changing now. How orthodontists and dentists and even pediatricians are thinking way outside the box and realizing that there's 
better ways to meet these objectives. So historically, headgear has been around for hundreds of years. Headgear is basically, in this case, I would call this quote unquote neck gear in this picture. I know that's not what we call it. In orthodontics, we call it cervical headgear. That means goes around um, your neck. There's also different forms of headgear. There's ones that go over the top of your head. And don't mind me, I used to love headgear. I used to do it all the time as an orthodontist. I loved it so much that when I was eight years old, I made my own headgear out of paper clips and now and laters, and I wore it to school because I wanted headgear so badly. So the fact that I'm even talking about this to thousands of people all over the world is pretty cool because you know what? Let me tell you all about headgear. Let me tell you how I'm a reformed headgear orthodontist, and I would never, ever, in most, most situations, use it now and why. So headgear is used for overjet. Overjet is what patients often call overbite. It gets confusing. Two different terms. The way you all use them and the way orthodontists use them is different. So I'm going to speak your language today and I'm going to say when the front teeth are more ahead of the lower teeth. Okay. So when the top teeth are more ahead of the lower teeth, we want to try to get the jaws to match up a little bit more. Why does this happen? It can be all one of many different reasons. It could be genetics. Maybe it overjets, small lower jaws run in your family. Okay. Well, some people say you can't change nature, but you totally can if you start early. So you, the earlier you start with these things, the better. I'm talking like four, five, six getting started. I'm not talking 12. Okay. So you do not need to wait for your family dentist to refer you to an orthodontist to get these problems addressed. If your family dress is not referring you, you are welcome to make your own appointment with a friendly orthodontist near you. And if you don't get the answer you're looking for and it's not feeling good in the pit of your stomach, first of all, you're welcome to reach out to me at any time, straightsmilesolutions.com. You can go to my webpage. You can go to the patient webpage and just get tons of information about different topics. You're also welcome to ask questions. I'm not a substitute and my team's not a substitute for medical advice, but we'll tell you not about your own particular situation, but we'll tell you about different options out there and how they're used. And we can also help to direct you to a very friendly orthodontist near you who specializes in growth and development and believes in airways and believes in correcting bites the right way. And we will find you that orthodontist if you need one. So don't worry about that. Give us that job. We don't earn any commission for this. This is just a gift that we give to the community to help you out because we believe in this. So let me digress. Let me go back to headgear. Why is headgear quote unquote bad? Because what it's doing is it's pulling those top teeth and, the, and restricting the growth of the top jaw, which is your maxilla. Well, your top jaw or your maxilla is extremely important. It's connected to your airway, your nose, and all of that. So if you're restricting the growth of that, a lot of not so good things can happen long term with the growth of your face, the shape of your face, the amount of air that can go in, the space for your tongue to go so that you can swallow correctly. This can affect all kinds of health issues later, okay, as well as the way you feel, the way you sleep. So we as orthodontists collectively, many of us are evolving and we're stepping away from using headgear to fix an overjet and we're moving towards all sorts of other systems to you to correct it that don't involve restricting the growth that actually encourage go think the other way if you have an overjet and your upper jaw is ahead of your lower jaw let's encourage the lower jaw to grow instead right everybody wants a nice full profile full lips right now there's a few situations and of course your orthodontist will measure to see what's right where sometimes headgear is necessary, but I would say it's very few and far between. And today we're gonna to be talking about class two and class three elastics with aligners. And what to do if you're not using Invisalign. Obviously, if you are using Invisalign, it's significantly easier. Here's an example of what their precision cuts look like. You can see here, can you see it on the canine? I'm gonna go ahead and hook that on for you. Now, in terms of what elastics to use, you're going to really have to try them in your patient and see there's no wrong or right answer to this. And it really depends on the morphology of the teeth and the bite. So let me show you what this looks like. See, this would be for a class two elastics, just hooks right on there. And then down on the bottom, it's going to go ahead and hook to the lower molar. You can use either the first or the second molar. You could either use a button or you can use precision cut to precision cut. So many, many options. It really depends on your personal preference. So we're going to go ahead and show you a diagram shortly about that. If you're going to go from button to button, you can do that too, actually. You can probably use heavier elastics. You might be able to use 316 heavy or even possibly 1.8 heavy. If you're going from precision cut to precision cut, 
it's gonna be a little bit different. In that case, oh, let me do that for you. I'm gonna set one up for you. You're gonna have to use a lighter elastic. You know, in that case, it's gonna be a little more challenging because you are gonna have to um, make sure that they're not getting displaced. So let me show you kind of what that looks like. And this is, I'm using a combination of clear correct and Invisalign. But so that's going from slot to slot, okay? So that means the patient is gonna go ahead and assemble this outside the mouth and then put it in their mouth all at one time, as opposed to going from button to button where you're gonna put the aligners in first, the buttons will already be on the teeth and then hook the elastics on. You know, what's a class two elastic? You can see how the orientation goes. In general, it's an elastic that normally hooks from the upper canine to the lower molar to correct an overjet. The actual size of the elastics is going to really vary. I'm talking about the diameter is going to vary on the amount of overjet or the, uh, the size of the teeth. So you really should stock several sizes. I would recommend stocking one eighth, three sixteenth, um, one quarter. Those are some good ones to stock. Then there's also strengths. Um, normal class two elastics, I'm going to use six ounce, but it also depends on what wire I'm on. And we can go into that more later. So do message me, visit straightsmilesolutions.com if you would like some more um, suggestions. But this, normally I'll run my elastics on a heavier wire. I'm not going to run it on an eye tie wire. It's going to be a stainless steel wire. I know that's really different than a lot of other IDB, IDB systems that are out there. Um, and I'll run 316th heavy, but again, you got to stock lots of sizes. It's not a one size fits all approach for elastics. There's some thought that needs to go into it. Do not run it on a light wire. All sorts of crazy things are going to happen. And that's basically all about class two elastics. Take them on, take them off. Every time you eat, they absolutely have to be on 22 hours a day. No ifs, ands, or buts. If the patient only wearing them 12 hours, 16 hours a day, they're not gonna work. There's just basically a seesaw effect and there's gonna be significantly more discomfort. So if you do not establish this with the patient and the parent, you know, at the beginning, you know, they're gonna, they're not gonna see success. You should, I, I, I'm gonna say confidently, you will see a change if you're seeing them on six week intervals and the wearing elastics, it will be evident, okay? It should be quite evident as a matter of fact. So if you're not seeing the change, you need to be confident in saying you're not wearing them enough. They may be wearing them 16 hours a day, but you need to troubleshoot. That means they need to be changing the elastics at least four times a day. Every few hours, they should be changing it. Usually I say four times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, bedtime, that's five, something like that. It's okay to change it more. You should be dispensing at least two bags of elastics every time that they come to the six week interval check. So, and remember as you're correcting the bite, the wires are gonna get pokey. You gotta trim it, right? And you still gotta check the patient. Hi, it's Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions. We're here today to talk a little bit about bio trainers, myofunctional appliances, and phase one appliances, and how to um, incorporate them into your practice, how to incorporate them into your phase one treatment, how to incorporate them into your phase two or comprehensive treatment. And I'm very, very honored that Great Lakes Dental Laboratory has picked me to do a series of videos, educational videos on their bio trainers to help train uh, orthodontists, general dentists, and pediatric dentists for indications of use. And I'm gonna be working my way through their series of appliances and telling you more. Uh, I have seen a lot of great outcomes with these appliances. This is, I believe, a European-based company and it's being distributed by Great Lakes in the US. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me and I'll be glad to talk to you more about phase one. Um, I have a great um, monograph or phase one quiz that I kind of created. Um, which will help you screen patients and to see if they need phase one. So I'm glad to send it to you. It's called My Phase One Smile. Feel free to email me at info at straightsmilesolutions.com or visit my website at straightsmilesolutions.com and I'll be glad to just give you a copy. I'll just give it to you. It's free. So um, I'm just glad to be helping people and that's my ultimate goal. So today we're going to be talking a little bit more about one of the series of appliances, one of the first appliances in their series. It's called You Start. Letter U, start. Indications for use are age four to six, okay? So we're thinking either our primary dentition, full primary dentition, or very, very early mixed, mixed dentition. I would probably discontinue this appliance once the six-year-old molars came in. So we're thinking like age four to six, maybe four to five. Once the six-year-old molars come in or the first few front teeth start to come in, it's time to move on to the next in the series of appliances. 
I'm going to be giving you all kinds of gems and tidbits about phase one treatment and how to use these appliances, how to bill for insurance. There's just so much information I can tell you. And it's something that we work with our clients with all the time. So, um, Thank you so much to Great Lakes for giving me samples of all the appliances. Um, I'm just going to kind of verbally tell you what I see and feel. You can see them. So this is the U-Concept um, appliance, the U-Start. Again, it's for age four to six. Okay. Um, I would just, this is just me saying, I would probably discontinue and move on to the next series once the six-year-old molars come in. These are not custom. Okay. So the, that means that you, you can just order them. You can stock them. The prices are very reasonable. Um, you may or may not get a discount or volume discount if you choose to stock them. Is this all you need for phase one? No, not necessarily. So phase one is interceptive treatment. You're getting the kid from A to Z. For me, you don't discontinue phase one until six-year-old molars are fully in and front teeth, top and bottom, are aligned, you know, and as well, um, and the arches are formed. So you know, it might be a part of the phase one process. Maybe this is all they need, but it's probably pretty unlikely. Um, so some of the features that I recognize in here is basically you've got some, it's real soft. If you can see how I can just touch it. So I think it's gonna be very comfortable. It does come in three colors, um, clear, which is nice because you can see the teeth easily through it as well as pink and blue. So you can choose what colors you want. It has some eruptive guidance. Um, features on the inside, like little imprints where, so as the teeth start to come up, they're going to bounce off the wall and come a little bit straighter. They also have a firm version, which is a little bit more rigid. Um, that only comes in clear. Um, from my experience, those are good if you have a Bruxer. Um, maybe you want to start with the soft. It's going to be much easier for the child to get used to wearing it if you start with the soft. And if you start getting bite throughs, then that's something you can move on to. Um, what else? So I see other features in here that are good. Basically, it's going to work for any patient that has up to a six millimeter overjet, um, as well as a slight class three patient. Um, you have to move on to a class three appliance if you do have a class three patient, but this is a good way to start if they're in early mixed dentition or in primary dentition and you start to see some anterior crossbite. You're probably going to get a little bit of arch expansion, but I don't think you're going to get too much with this. I mean, it is pretty, pretty soft. Maybe if you need more arch expansion, you'll want to move on to the more rigid one, or you'll want to go into a Schwartz um, or some type of expander and feel free to connect with me on that. I have tons of YouTube videos on that. Um, looks like we also have um, a little, little place. I call it a pillow for the tongue to rest so that the tongue doesn't go down. It remembers to swell up at the roof of the mouth. So just some tips on delivering this appliance. Initially, a good way, you don't just say, give it to the patient and say, go. Okay. So it's going to take some time, especially if the patient is a mouth breather, it's going to take them to time to get used to wearing this. And we want to take baby steps. So I usually tell patients, hey, you know, first night, you know, why don't you try to wear it during one cartoon or, you know, one video game or something like that, or while we read a book to bed. And then the next week you can move up to a movie um, or while you do your homework. And eventually we're going to try to wear it all night long. Now, some patients might take a few weeks to keep it in all night long. Some patients might take a few months to keep it in all night long. Over time, the mouth is going to grow the musculature to be able to rate, retain the appliance. And the nasal breathing is going to help the patient significantly. So um, remember, if the patient has a cold or something, this is not um, a good time to start this appliance. We want to have patent nasal breathing. So if you need to address that with some allergy spray or something like that first with the child's pediatrician, you definitely want to do it. Also, let's just get into this. You need to be screening your patients well. You can't just give this to a patient because a patient that maybe has swollen tonsils or um, nasal or, you know, oropharyngeal airway blockage, this is not a good indication for the patient. Although this might help the patient, you want to make sure you're working with the child's pediatrician if you are screening um, melampotty, tonsils, stuff like that, and, you know, refer out as needed and collaborate with the pediatrician or the ENT. And I'm glad to give you some guidance around that as well. So again, this is the U Start appliance uh, for age four through six, primary primary dentition or early mixed dentition. Um, it does come in three colors, pink, blue, and clear in the soft. And if you move up to the rigid, it only comes in clear. You can order these from Great Lakes. Glad to tell you more. You can go ahead and visit my website at straightsmilesolutions.com. Keep those questions coming. And I would love to see your cases if you start using them. Number one exciting thing today is that the MA device, the MA feature component of um, Invisalign has been FDA approved in the US. This is actually very exciting. Um, you've probably seen some of my videos before. I'm not 
I'm not a huge fan of the design. I think there's a better way to do mandibular advancement. Um, you can you can watch those. You can watch my criticism on it. But I'm excited that it did get FDA approved. I'm excited that doctors here will have an opportunity to use it. I've had some experience with it, um, not directly, but indirectly with clients, Straight Smile Solutions clients who have opted to put this into their treatment plans. These are doctors in Canada, Asia that I've worked with. Um, that have been using this for some time. It gets kind of mixed reviews from my clients and we can go over that directly if you have questions, but you know, it's available, it's there. I believe, and this is my understanding here in the US, and of course, Align Technology never returns any of my questions or inquiries. So I'm just going off what I heard hearsay. And if they are more than welcome to reach out to me and answer my questions. Um, I believe it's only available in the phase one feature, the phase one um, treatment that you can get. I believe it's not a feature in comprehensive treatment at this moment or in phase two. So um, that's pretty much all I know. Any questions, please visit straightsmilesolutions.com. But again, anything that involves growing mandibles when it needs to be grown, of course, you have to know a lot about skeletal growth. You need to know a lot about so much you need to know. And I just, I get very nervous that this power is now available. And I say power because used incorrectly, you can damage a child that this power is not available, now available for every single dentist out there in the US who's just certified in Invisalign. I don't think you have to take an additional course for it. 